main points in Marxist economic theories. Marxist theories are massive in economics. I brought, you can look at the break, some of his books, for example, this is the first volume of Capital. This is the, the number one book taken out of the Vist Library. It's a very popular book at Vist. It's taken out all the time um, and underlined all over. This is one volume. The other two volumes are just as thick, volumes two and volumes three, that are all, all economics. He also has the theories of surplus value, which I mentioned in the first lecture, which is three volumes about this thick. I don't have one of those here, but to give you an idea, that would be six volumes. And then another volume is Grundrisse, which is his foundation writings that didn't come out in English until the 1970s, and it's massive, too. You can see this thing is just huge. This is all his economic, basic economic writings to get ready to write capital. In between Grundrisse and capital, he wrote a little piece called The Critique of Political Economy I mentioned. So this is a little smaller. This one's uh, just a couple hundred, 300 pages or so. so. And this is another part that you have to look at for his economic writings. And then if you're efficient about it, you look at, I mentioned these, the first lecture, Wage, Labor, and Capital, Value, Price, and Profit, are two short series of lectures he gave which summarize key points. So you can get a lot of marks out of a little thing like this and skip all the big stuff if you want to. It's not everything there, but it, it gives you a lot to the wordage. But it's a lot of material. A lot of the material that I'm going to cover in this section I got out of the third bar in the capital and out of Grundrisse and some of the more obscure writings of Marx. And this is, especially this last section on overproduction crises. But what, what we're going to I'm going to go through first is his theory of exploitation. This is more common, it's more widely discussed when people who have studied Marx study alienation and they go on to exploitation. So this is, that's fairly straightforward. From there, I'll start pushing Marx in a way that's maybe not as standard as um, what you'll get in, with other people. I'm going to start pushing his emphasis on money and credit because I think his some of his key contributions in understanding capitalism come with his understanding of what money's all about, what credit's all about, what interest rates are all about, and a lot of this, as I said, comes out of the third volume of capital on Grunrisse. So, so the second part, capitalist accumulation, we'll look at um, his ideas of industrial versus money, capital, and then move into wealth and misery. That'll be a, a fairly common one, as it's the poor get poorer, the rich get richer. Um, profit and interest, his theory of interest is interesting, and his concept of credit. Credit becomes a key concept in Marx's understanding of capitalism. Marx is trying to prove in his economics that capitalism is unstable. Capitalism falls apart. And so, so the emphasis I'm looking at is his model of why capitalism is unstable and falls apart. That'll come out then in the third section, so we'll do A and B and then take a break. The third section, overproduction crises, I'll try and walk you through his model of how an economy expands and contracts. What's interesting about Marx in this is that he is, in many ways, the godfather of macroeconomics. He's the first major economist to try and talk about the whole economy and how the whole economy moves in cycles. Um, the term macroeconomics that we use today comes from the theories of John Maynard Keynes in the 30s, and John Maynard Keynes up in Cambridge developed a model to explain why capitalism was unstable and the need for government intervention to maintain a capitalist system. Keynes, so the term, modern term comes from Keynes, but the theory really starts with Marx. Marx is your first major economist to try and explain a whole move of economics, as opposed to talking about supply and demand for tomatoes or something. It's talking about the whole thing. Okay, um, I guess we'll have to push off. The, this week's Weekly Mail talks about Mabeki being released, and he says, quote, probably his last quote for a while, um, I'm still a member of the Communist Party, I still embrace Marxist views, end quote. My question is, and when I read that, is that what does he mean by Marxist views? Does he embrace Marxist theory of the business cycle, or alienation, or what? It would be interesting to talk to him and see what his views are. My guess is he probably doesn't understand a lot of what's in this, this today's talk. It's more the alienation issue, the issue of exploitation, than it is the whole issue of economic instability. Um, okay, let's see if we can get through that. Exploitation. Exploitation can build on Marxist theories of alienation, historical materialism, and the labor theory of value. 
So exploitation is based on his philosophy. Exploitation is the basis of his economic model. I'm going to start there in the first quote the, from the Communist Manifesto. The bourgeoisie, whenever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly, pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest than callous cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fever, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of philistine sentimentalism, and the icy water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal wealth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefeasible chartered freedoms, has set up a single unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusion, that means medieval exploitation, exploitation of the Middle Ages, in, for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusion, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. The whole system of free trade is a system of exploitation. Okay. What, what this comes out with is a notion of wage labor. It says the essential condition for the existence and for the sway of the bourgeois class is the formation and augmentation of capital. The condition of capital is wage labor. Wage labor is exploitation. It's an unjust and unequal relationship between the owners of capital and the owners of labor. The capitalists have control. The laborers must sell their labor to the capitalists in order to live. They have no choice. The capitalists have the upper hand. He first explains this in these 1847 lectures to the German Working Men's Club, which is in wage labor and capital. Um, labor power, then, is a commodity, no more, no less than is sugar. The first is measured by the clock, the other by scales. Their commodity, labor power, the workers exchange for the commodity of the capitalists, for money. Consequently, labor power is a commodity which its possessor, the wage worker, sells to the capitalist. Why does he sell it? It is in order to live. But the worker whose only source of income is the sale of his labor power cannot leave the whole class of buyers, that is the capitalist class, unless he gives up his own existence. He'll starve unless he sells himself to the capitalist. He does not belong to this or to that capitalist, but to the capitalist class. And it is for him to find his man, that is to find a buyer in this capitalist class, somebody who will take his labor. So free enterprise of Marx doesn't mean voluntary exchange, it means subjection of one class by another. The worker's a slave to wages, he's a slave to the capitalist. Um, the quote that I've got here, and I think it's worth going through a bit, is this is a good example of dialectics, this next quote, where Marx is saying on the surface there's all this free trade and exchange, but underneath there's this exploitative relationship. And this comes out of um, the third volume of Capital, I believe. No, this is out of the first volume of Capital. <coughs> the consumption of labor power is completed outside the limits of the market or the sphere of circulation. The consumption of labor power, when the capitalist consumes his worker, is in production. It's not in exchange. Accompanied by Mr. Moneybags, like he always says Mr. Moneybags, all through his talk. <laughs> Accompanied by Mr. Moneybags and by the possessor of labor power, the worker, we therefore take leave for a time of this noisy sphere where everything takes place on the surface and in the view of all men, and follow them both into the hidden abode of production, on whose threshold there stares us in the face no admittance except on business. So we're going to leave the market and go into the factory. This sphere that we are deserting, though, first, what are we leaving? And the market, within whose boundary the sale and purchase of labor goes on, is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. And now he's very He's very sarcastic of what a market is all about. There alone rules freedom, equity, property, and Bentham. Bentham refers to Jeremy Bentham, who is the, the developed the philosophy of utilitarianism. At this time period, people do things for utility. Freedom because both buyer and seller of a commodity save labor power constrained only by their own free will. Equality because each enters into relation with the other as with a simple owner of commodities and they exchange equivalent for equivalent, property because each disposes only of what is his own, and Bentham because each looks only to himself, each looks only to, him, to himself only, and no one troubles about the rest. Everybody's self-interested. But leaving this, and leaving the sphere of exchange of commodities which furnishes the free trade of Vogaris with his views and ideas, we think we can perceive a change in the physiognomy of our dramatis persona. 
people start changing, actually, physically. He who before was the money owner now strides in front as capitalist. The possessor of labor power follows as his laborer. The one with an air of importance, smirking intent on business, the other timid and holding back, like one who is bringing his own hide to market and has nothing to expect but a hiding. View of the relationship. There's two levels there. Okay. Appearance and this is the appearance and the reality of capitalist industrial relations. The appearance is free trade, the reality is exploitation, according to Marx. Underneath the, man uh, in the, underneath the surface, in the factory, the manager dominates the worker. Exploitation takes place in the factory behind the scenes. It's in the production process. It's not in the trading, it's in the producing. Okay. So that's, and it's the wage relationship that brings us about. What goes on in the factory is the production of surplus value. In production, the capitalist extracts surplus value out of his workers. His wages only enable him to maintain his own labor power. The worker is paid enough to stay alive, period. You, you pay a worker enough to keep him going. You don't pay him anything more than that, to make him, to keep him productive. More sophisticated models of Marxism might say you pay him enough not only to keep him alive, but that he can reproduce and have future workers available, too. So you've got to maybe pay enough to maintain a family of workers, a class of workers. But, so there is a subsistence no notion there. Um, the minimum of the value of labor power is determined by the value of commodities without the daily supply of which the laborer cannot renew his vital energy, consequently by the value of those means of subsistence that are physically indispensable. Um, when I went out and visited one of the mines, uh, Rand Mines, about a month ago, the mine owners were very explicit in showing us the hostile accommodations and the food that the workers ate and all this stuff. A Marxist would say, yeah, well, it makes sense. You've got to keep your workers alive. You've got to feed them so they're going to go down and produce for you. That's perfectly fine. That's not, you can't use that as a reason why capitalism is good. And capitalists have got to keep their machines oiled if you aren't working. That's part of the system. What capitalists will then do, though, is pay the worker enough to keep them alive but extract from the worker more value that the worker produces beyond that which is necessary to keep them alive. The paragraph I write there, in the production process, a worker may need to work only three hours to produce enough to sustain his livelihood. If his hourly wage is one rand, then in three hours he earns three rand. However, his contract with the capitalist may be three rands for eight hours of work. In a day, he produces eight rand of value and ends only three rand. The remaining five rand is surplus value that goes to the capitalist. Surplus value is any revenue that the firm earns above the wage of the worker. Who are you collecting me? That's me. Yours. That's me, and then the quote from him is afterwards. That's Marx, says the, Marx does it on a half a day. I just made it a little more extreme. Marx says, the fact that half a day's labor is necessary to keep a laborer alive during 24 hours does not in any way prevent him from working a whole day. Therefore, the value of the labor power and the value which the labor of power creates in the labor process have two entirely different magnitudes. And this difference of the two values was what the capitalist had in view when he was purchasing the labor power. The capitalist wants the difference between eight rand and three rand, what he has to pay the worker and what he can make. The owner of the money has paid the value of a day's labor power. His, therefore, is the use of it for a day. A day's labor belongs to him. If we cannot compare the two processes of producing value and of creating surplus value, we see that the latter is nothing but the continuation of the former behind a certain definite point. Well, in my example, the creation of surplus value starts with the fourth hour. The first three hours, the worker works himself. The fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth hour, the worker works for the, the capitalist. In Marx's viewpoint, all value comes from labor, so any money that the firm makes beyond what they pay the worker is exploitation. It's taken from it. Strong but statement. Doesn't he make any other expenses in the consideration? He does a little bit in materials, but that's minor. You know, he'll do a little bit. He'll say that material, but materials really should belong to the people, so you shouldn't really have an expense there. But aren't wages usually minor in our setup today that we have a lot of other overhead expenses? Well, if you include all wages, because you also have wages of your, uh, your 
managers, your accountants, and so on, not just the guy who's out there pounding the crack of the rock in the mind. Not to mention your patient who you talk to stop with, and that's, that's your way to see any while you act. Yeah, but Mark, the question why you would even pay that, that's an odd one, pensioners, but because now you're not getting any work out of them anymore. Yeah, that's so you pay the um, But the uh, wages, well, in, at least in the United States, I heard it's lower here in the United States, it's about 75% of national income is wages, even today. I think in South Africa, somebody told me the other day, it's about 60% is wages here. Uh, there's a lot more capital intensivity in the big industries here than there is in the States. Um, the frustrating thing to me is that no cognizance is taken of supply and demand. That's no, the surface. That's not the reality. He's aware of it. He talks about it. That's the area of free trade, but that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is to pull value out of workers, get them down to the mines, make them crack rocks, pull the value out of them. That's but the whole view. If so you don't pay him enough to, 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 to uh, take care of the demand, then he, he won't come. Well, you pay him enough. You pay the worker enough for him to live. But his, uh, he's got an idea, we'll see later, he has an idea of, of, a, um, of an economy in which is, there is surplus labor, always. La everybody's working at subsistence. We'll see that down the way here where there's a reserve army of the unemployed. And it fits with South Africa. South Africa has an incredible surplus labor problem. The Marxists would say, see, this is how capitalism works. There's massive surplus labor. People have to come in, take the wages they want, and starve. If you've got to have a reservoir of labor, otherwise you can't function. Well, he would say that's, that's one of the evils of the system that people are reserving, uh, out of work. And he contends it's massive amounts of people that will be out of work. I, you know, I'm not saying this model's right, I'm just saying this is what it is. And I don't agree with it. <laughs> Again, if you take mining as an industry, for example, I mean, their costs are huge. The labor is only part of their cost. It's mm -hmm. not, a, it's not mm -hmm. a very big cost. But the cost. only place value comes from is from the worker. So all those other costs, now the cost of capital, when we get to capital, see all capital is is embodied labor. So the value, the, if you say that there's capital costs, Marx would say no, because some worker previously produced that capital. So that call, all goes back to the worker. And what it is is the capitalists are extracting value from the workers. This is why a union that follows this viewpoint will, will start as a bargaining that we want it off, and then back off in a bargaining negotiation, because their perspective is, is that all value, all revenue was produced by the workers, and so it's all legitimately there. So we've got to figure out how to take it. It's not a question of... of What's the right amount? The right amount is all of it. All value comes from the worker. If you're talking in terms, you have a, a, an expense bill for your operation of, say, ten million a month, mm -hmm. and the union actually turn around and say, right, you're offering us fifteen percent. What is that as a percentage of your total wage of your total expense bill? That is one percent immaterial. <coughs> other expense in there, a great component of that ultimately is a wage paid somewhere else. And then it becomes irrelevant to that. And they won't accept that. No, so you know, well, the bargaining makes sense. The bargaining position is to go for as much yeah, as you get. Yeah, they say everything is labor. The fact that the material you buy comprises comprise labor somewhere else. And that uh, that man has also got a demand that's interesting. But that, that, that is what Marx would say, is all this other stuff comes from somebody else's labor. Could we actually use that as a yeah. yeah. It's, and it's true. I mean, essentially, this, and essentially, in a sense, what Marx is saying, he pushes his point, but there's some truth in it. A lot of value comes from work, right? That's, you know, we, in a sense, they think people produce stuff. It's not totally true. Because yeah. you do get things that are presented to you by nature. Yeah, but then those don't have value per se. They're gifts. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, they aren't value in his concept of value. He's focusing on the human aspect of this whole thing. Okay. The way the system works then is uh, the capitalist spends money paying wages to make money selling commodities. And Marx goes through a lot of models where he'll talk about money, commodities, money, or commodities, money, commodity. And the capitalist relation is money, commodities, money, prime, if you will, MCM prime. The capitalist takes his money, turns into commodities, and then makes more money out of it. The, the worker works the other way around. The worker goes commodities, money, commodity. 
by turning his money into commodities, it serves as the material element of a new product that is factored in the labor process by incorporating living labor with their dead substance. The capitalist, that substance is labor already embodied in capital. The capitalist is at the same time converts value, that is, past materialized and dead labor into capital, into value, big with value, a live monster that is fruitful and multiplies. So he's arguing that labor is now getting into commodities. Some of these commodities essentially become capital goods. The essence of a, la of a capitalist is to take surplus value and take labor, power, if you will, extract it as surplus value and transform it into capital. And capital then works other labor and makes more capital and makes more capital and so on. Um, um, what he's, and it's sort of this, this essence, like we were talking about the other day, it's this notion of value that's in, in these... Uh, commodities and in these capital goods. He does a lot on the, the algebra of this whole system, and I just give you a little bit of it here. That He talks about the capitalist advances capital, here capital C, to the production process. It consists of constant capital and variable capital, C equal to C plus V. Constant capital is machinery and materials. Variable capital is wages spent to hire labor power. Living labor power creates surplus value, S, so therefore, the value of a commodity is C plus V plus S. And then he'll go on and on with this stuff, and we don't need to go into that. He also then develops a measure of exploitation. I wrote there, Marx develops a measure of the rate of surplus value. I should call that the rate of exploitation. The rate of exploitation is V divided by S. It's variable capital divided by surplus uh, value. Or another way of saying it is the ratio of necessary labor, which is the wages to keep the workers alive, divided by surplus labor, which is the work that the worker does for the capitalist. The rate of surplus value is therefore an exact expression for the degree of exploitation of labor power by capital or of the laborer by the capitalist. That's the, the rate of surplus value or rate of exploitation. Call it either one. Okay, so I, he has then a very technical model of exploitation. It's quantifiable. It can be measured. Is surplus value the same as profit? Um, we'll see in a bit. It's, it's close. It's, it's a concept of gross profit, if you will, gross return. Okay, but it's a little different than what we would think of as profit. Okay, the last section here, and this, this one section, is on the concept of capital. Um, oof, capital. In order, I think once you see that this labor, labor is exploited by capital, then we ask, well, what do we mean by capital? I think we're over pages and pages and pages on capital. What I've done here is I've brought, brought it down to three key quotes from them, hoping that these will give you a feel what this word capital means. The first one is from these lectures, early lectures. Before we go on to that, sometimes this Labor power is the actual work that the person does, and labor is the person. So you don't sell your labor, you sell your actual moving your arms, your power, as far as, and uh, Marx himself used the words interchangeably, and later on Engels started to say labor power is a more precise meaning as opposed to labor. He was trying to say that what the worker wasn't selling his body, per se, he was selling his, his work, yeah, his, his effort. So. It's, it's to distinguish it from actually, you know, a slave system, per se. You're not selling your, 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 the labor isn't selling his labor, per se. He's selling his labor power. So it's just a technical thing. It's not that big a deal. I just, uh, to me, what is labor power again? Labor power is the actual working, not just the worker himself, not the laborer. The work done. Yeah, the work done. Yeah, that's basically what's called slavery. Yes, there was, and um, there were, in fact, this quote even mentions it here. There's, there's still slavery in, um, in the States when he's writing this theory. Um, accumulated labor that serves as the means of production is capital. Capital is accumulated labor. So say the economists. But it's, it's accumulated labor of a certain type. And what he does, he makes a comparison with slavery. He says, what is a Negro slave, a man of the black race? The one explanation is worthy of the other. Slavery is a certain historical institution, so is capital. You just can't say it's accumulated labor. You just can't say a slave is a slave. So the Negro is a Negro. Only under certain conditions does he become a slave. A cotton spinning machine is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain conditions does it become capital. 
torn away from these conditions, it is a little torn away from these conditions. It, did I lose something? It is, a, it is as little capital as gold by itself is money. Capital also is a social relation of production. It is a bourgeois relation of production, a relation of production of bourgeois society. Capital, consequently, is not only a sum of material products, it is a sum of commodities of exchange values of social magnitude. The existence of a class which possesses nothing but the ability to work is a necessary presupposition of capital. It is only the dominion of past accumulated materialized labor over immediate living labor that stamps the accumulated labor with the character of capital. Labor is accumulated, the capital is accumulated labor, but accumulated labor that exploits living labor. If you will, the machine exploiting the man. Wait, can I ask you, what do, they mean, what do you mean by the existence of a class? Class of people, the working uh, class. Uh, of a class of people, the proletariat. See, he posits, that capitalism is a system in which one group owns the capital and another group owns labor. And never the twain shall meet. Mm. The easiest way to think of Marxist capitalism is to think of the Soviet Union. One group owns the capital, it's called the Soviet Union, Russia, Moscow, and the masses own nothing. That's, that's, his, that's how he sees capitalism developing, is what we have now in the Soviet Union, in which you have a proletariat working class that has no share ownership. And then you have a group that controls everything. You know, it's the Communist Party, if you will, the Central Bureau of, of the Soviet government mm -hmm. that controls everything. Does he use a word does he use a word for that part of wealth which is not capital, i.e. is not used in the person group? For example. Well, I mean is, does he have capital and X where capital plus X equal wealth? Does he, does he ever use a word for capital which is for wealth which is not mainly in the person group? No, because wealth basically all comes from labor originally. You know, wealth and value and those concepts. He talks about the modern concepts, which so see a little bit of rent, interest, profits, and all these, but his, they're all variants of value, value created by labor, and value initially goes into <coughs> wages and surplus value. And then from surplus value, it spreads out into other things. Yeah, surely, surely not all surplus value is capital. Capital is only that value which you use to exploit goods, which is labor. In other words, commodities, groceries in the shop or in the shelf, the clothes that you wear are not capital. Well, then they're part of necessary labor. But if they're not capital, they're part of the necessary labor to keep the working class going. Well, I think that's the yeah. A gold coin which is not invested in a factory. A gold coin is accumulated labor. Yeah, but that's money now. Oh, but that's yeah. Yeah. what you mean is gold, it's not. All right, all right. An item of, of extrinsic utility which has been done by work. The yeah, labor in it is no longer going to be used for employing labor to make more wealth. Well, if it's no longer used and it's been pulled out of the system, the capitalist is consuming it. His emphasis is, he does look at gold. Gold's very big, but his emphasis is, and I'm, I'm pressing here, is the creation of wealth to create more wealth to create more wealth. His big kick is on that, that it just keeps being invested. Now, the capitalists probably take some out by some BMWs and things, but that's sort of minor. Um, I'm thinking of what later on, Pierre Schroffer, when he does his model, production of commodities by commodities, talks about necessary goods versus luxury goods. And a luxury good would be a good like jewelry that's pulled out and you don't need it to produce other goods. And so this is that, uh, a later day Marxist does that distinction. But the luxury goods are a small part of the whole economic system. The whole economic system is one of the stuff going back in and in and in. That's the major part. Does he make a, 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 a does he differentiate between who controls capital and who owns it? Yeah, we'll get to that when we get to the bankers versus the industrial ones. Yeah, that's the big, it's a big part of his model. And the bankers are the evil ones. And if your bankers are serious, it's bad. It wouldn't be capital if you took money and you put it in a drawer and just left it there. No, you've got to work it. You put it back into the system. Unless you, you use it as part of your assets. Yeah. You know, just like he says that gold is by itself is in money. It's only money if it's used as money. A machine isn't capital unless it's used as a machine in the system. Mm -hmm. Capital Capital is a, an abstract social phenomenon. To be a capitalist is to have not only a purely personal, but a social status in production. Capital is a collective product, and only by the united action of all members of society can be set into motion. Capital, is therefore, is not a personal, it is a social power, a power in the system. 
has a definite social relationship. And I say Marx style is the magnum opus capital for good reason. It's, this is his concept of, the, of embodied exploited labor, if you will, that's running the system. And the last quote comes from the third volume of Capital, and it's one of the strongest ones explaining what he means by it. However, capital is not a thing, but a rather a definite social production relation belonging to a definite historical formation of society, which is manifested in a thing and lends this thing a specific social character. Capital is not the sum of the material and produced means of production. Capital is rather mm. the means of production transformed into capital, whatever that means. Mm. This is which in themselves are no more capital than gold and silver in itself is money. It is the means of production monopolized by a certain section of society confronting living labor powers as products and working conditions rendered independent of this very labor power, which are personified to this antithesis in capital. Capital, then, is a class of people confronting another class of people in which as one class produces value, the other class takes it. It's the whole system that's capital. It is not merely the products of labor is turned into independent powers, products as rulers and buyers of their products, but rather also the social forces in the future form of this labor, which confront the laborers as properties of their products. Here, then, we have a definite, at first glance, very mystical social form of one of the factors in the historically produced social production process. You read through those quotes a couple times, you see it's a very abstract concept, and it's um, that capital is a, it's a force, you know, it's sort of like in the... It's an accumulation of dead men's labor power. Yeah, it's an accumulation of dead men's labor power that's been transubstantiated into this thing. It's sort of like in Darth Vader or something, the force will be with you. It's there. Okay. Now the question. If you can understand that section, you're in good shape. That's, that's tough stuff. How would you define social? The word social, what, 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 in, in what Society, the community, the people. The community. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the society. That's what he says. The right. social power is a societal power. Now, this is an interesting question, um, because in the States, we, um, we often talk about how the Sunday in April, and I think it is now, uh, the first four months of the year, or whatever it is, you work for the government, and then after that, the rest of the year, it's your money. And they, the, the, the National Taxpayers Union always publishes what the date is, and it keeps moving back as we keep getting more and more to the States. In the context of my, my comparison to the Soviet Union, there's really no difference. It's, you know, and, and we'll see next week that the state is part of the capitalist system. So whether or not you're paying it out to the shareholders of Anglo-American, you're paying it out to the National Party in Pretoria, you would say it's all part of the same system. But, but it seems presumably, what's Marxism is boiling down to the, uh, to the end, is some body, some group of people who have control of the way we increase the living sleep. <laughs> and that body has to have money to pay No, 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 no. It boils down to the abolishment of any system like that at all. Marxism. Is Marx anti-state? Yeah, he's an anarchist. The state is part of capitalism. Capitalism oh, goes to state. Of <laughs> 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 there's some good parts of Marx. I like that part. But, uh, no, he's, he, but he's in favor of, he sees the state, and well, that's the next first part of the next talk in politics, the state capitalism. The state is part of the capitalist system. And this is why if you talk to Marxists, and I've talked with leftists here at the university, it's very hard to talk about say, Pretoria versus the stock exchange, or the free market versus the government, because a Marxist views it all part of the same thing. It's all together. And they can give millions of examples of how it's together. You can see it all over the place. I went to a lecture the other day where these guys, from a guy from the Reserve Bank was talking about the need for more government subsidies for farmers, white farmers in South Africa. You know, Marxists say, see, that's how capitalism works. The government subsidizes the white farmers, and that's what it's all about. He puts them together. So he wants to get rid of the state and the capitalism. And in Marx, now modern day Marxists will argue, modern day Marxists will argue to replace capitalism with the state. And that, be, and that but that's not <coughs> neo Marxism. That's not the original theory. And when we get to his dictatorship of the proletariat, Marx will look at the state as a means to moving towards the abolishment of the state. And that's the fantasy, part five. That's a problem. He does talk about using the state as a vehicle towards communism but he doesn't really know how to make sense out of that, you know, as far as I can see. Sure, and the trick is to get rid of the state, that's all, not capitalism. Well, that's oh. the 
depends on your view. There's a. What do you put in its place? You don't. Is that if, uh, but in, in the if, present world, it'll, it'll just be, become something. If, if you take um, modern critics and just say here, modern critics of state capitalism, I won't have to come to next week's talk of this, this is part of it, but modern critics of state capitalism on the left and on the free market side, if you want, which I hate to say right, because I consider the free market a very left-wing movement, but that's another story, it's a liberal movement. Um, the um, people that, socialists and say socialists and capitalists, both are opposed to state capitalism. The capitalists, the libertarians, want to get rid of the state. The socialists want to get rid of the capitalism. They both see this, the problem as a combination of these two. They just, which is the power base? Is the power base in, in Johannesburg or is the power base in Pretoria? Depends on who you talk to. Um, and you'll see that. You'll see that when you talk to these people. When you talk to socialists, they'll say they don't like the combination of Pretoria and Johannesburg. We're going to destroy Johannesburg and we're going to put in a socialist Pretoria. The Black Will Pretoria, Black Will Social State. I had a huge argument with this guy the other day from uh, the Sowetan on that. So when we get in power, we're going to have good censorship instead of bad censorship. You know, this type of stuff. You know, it's just the standard of the censorship baloney. Okay, um, so we're pushing ahead there. Back to his economics. We'll get a. I'm a I won't mention too much in the state today, but because uh, we're doing more of his economic system per se. The the next step I want to take you through is this whole notion of capitalist accumulation. The motto that he sees is capitalism is an engine for capitalist accumulation. It builds and builds and builds and builds. And we see that. I mean, that's how capitalism works. It's working its tail off, building things. He's going to try and show how this works and then move it towards why it's unstable. Okay. First of all, the section on industrial money capital. There's two types of capital. But in general, capitalists make their wealth by expanding capital. They make money by spending money and making money and spending money. Mm -hmm. The boundless greed after riches, this passionate chase after exchange value is common to the capitalist and to the miser. But while the miser is merely a capitalist gone mad, <laughs> which would be somebody owning jewelry, if you will, um, the capitalist is a rational miser. The never-ending augmentation of exchange value is attained by the more acute capitalist by constantly throwing it afresh into circulation. So he would say somebody that puts all their wealth in the jury is just an idiot. You know, what the capitalists do is they put their wealth back and they make more and more and more. That's a good capitalist. Okay. He divides it between money capital and industrial capital. There's a money class of capitalists and an industrial class of capitalists. The industrialist is the man who puts the capital to work. He's, and Marx calls him the man without fortune. He borrows capital with the expectation that he will function as a capitalist and appropriate unpaid labor with borrowed capital. The industrial capitalist is the entrepreneur. The Marx doesn't use that word much. It's, that's essentially the industrial capitalist. It's a, in a modern economic sense, an entrepreneur is somebody who has no ownership of capital at all, but is the person who puts capital to work. It's the doer. It's the alert person. And Marx has that person. He calls him an industrial capitalist. Well, I refer to him mostly as an industrialist. Interesting, he realizes the popularity of the entrepreneur in bourgeois political economy or in people that support capitalism. He says at one point, the circumstance that a man without fortune but possessing energy and ability and business acumen may become a capitalist in this manner is greatly admired by the apologists of the capitalist system. So he says that, a, that an entrepreneur can, can become successful is admired by apologists. For somebody who is an apologist, say, yeah, that's the wonder, wonderful thing about capitalism. <coughs> On that point, I'll just mention that a problem with the post-Marxian system <coughs> is not only do they throw out the, the means by which we measure what we do, money, exchange, prices, and so on, but they throw out the entrepreneur. There's very little appreciation of the entrepreneur in, post in Marxist societies. Mm. Uh, they just don't appreciate it. How, does, how, do you, how do you reward somebody for individual effort when everything's supposed to be done by the collective? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Are you saying there's no cognizance of organization and creativity? Not, there is, in Marx, it, there's going to be creativity and organization, but in some type of spontaneous communal group, not in the sense of a structured, property rights based factory with managers and shippers and salesmen and whatever. It doesn't work that way. All that stuff's gone. I don't know how it works. Would there be, be, be a role for education? In Marx? Not, not in him. Education's there, but it's 
he doesn't develop, see, that's the thing, he doesn't develop this model of what it's going to look like. The post, um, the neo Marxists do. From you? <laughs> Nobody would be able to understand this, yeah. Well, there is a way to you get around to, to, to the current situation in the world and the, uh, what we're doing to destroy it. Well, this, this, what these guys are doing is um, in places like the Soviet Union, as I understand, education is very important to teach people a new way of thinking. And, um, but that's less than Marx himself. He thought, he was thinking more of a Catholic, that he was a transformation of spirit once we got rid of these institutions, things were just that people would start thinking communally somehow. Uh, okay, the, um, the middleman between, the industrialist is the middleman between wage labor and money capital. The real capitalist, the capitalist par excellence, is the money capitalist or the banker. Bankers control the system. He uses the word money capitalist most of the time. I just, I'll just use the word banker. It's a much more comfortable word with me. That's what, what money in the hand of the lender does not do, it does in the hands of the borrower. It performs its real money as capital in the hands of the borrower. The borrower is the entrepreneur. That's the one that puts it to work, but the mon person who lends it is the one that really controls the purse strings. Capital can accordingly be called money in process as it goes through a series of processes in which it preserves itself, departs from itself, and returns to itself increased in volume. So what you've got now is a system in which the bankers will lend money to the industrialist. The industrialist will work it, the money will go back to the bankers, and so on. It gets bigger and bigger. So money starts coming into the picture here. Capitalists must accumulate capital. Moreover, the development of capitalist production makes it constantly necessary to keep increasing the amount of capital laid out in a given industrial undertaking. And competition makes the imminent laws of capitalist, product, capitalist production to be felt by each individual capitalist as external course of laws. It compels him to keep constantly extending his capital in order to preserve it, but extend it he cannot accept by means of progressive accumulation. And so you've got a system where capitalists are driven to make profit constantly. That's what's going on. It's not. It's. 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 It's, it's, not a, it's not a totally unreasonable picture of how capitalism works. And a money capitalist could be me lending a hundred grand to somebody. Yeah. Any, not just bankers. Not just bankers, but bankers institutionally have become important because in economic crises, they're going to get it. Yeah. The, the industrialists are going to go broke, and the bankers pick up the pieces. That's just sort of. Yeah. And then with that. Down the down a few pages we get to that. I'll talk a little bit about inflation next week, I think. But uh, um, now, uh, hang on. We'll, we'll see how this goes. You know, inflation isn't really key to this model. It's a key in other models that are similar to this. But you keep and you keep spending, and how you spend is by hiring labor and exploiting them, and taking more value out of them. Mm -hmm. That's what you're spending, and you're spending on hiring workers and, and you know pulling value out of workers. Okay. And then yeah, but you're getting as much as you're spending. Are you getting more because you're exploiting them? Yeah. Right. The, the definition of Capital is a, it's, it's a very complex concept. Capital is a social phenomenon. Capital is money. money capital is process. money in process. Money in process, this means now that the, the, the power, this dead labor now has been moved from money into an industrialist who hires living labor and built machines and so on. So it then, so you've got this money, commodities, money thing, product commodities and capital. And, uh, so capital is a force that's flowing through the system and control of that force is by the capitalist class. Whoever they happen to be. Well, it is a relationship because you buy labor for the money. That's how you. That's your industrial relation. That's how you communicate with your people. You communicate through money. It's a cash nexus world. There's earlier quotes about it. it's an exchange world, a cash nexus world. How we relate is all through money, and money is is the flow of power, if you will, and power of. of value comes from originally from labor. And he'll tie, we won't go into it heavily here, but he ties the creation of money all the way back to gold production. He's very big on gold, gold for money because gold is created with labor, and that's why it's a value. It's because it's created with labor. So he's, um, 
And so gold is money makes a lot of sense to them. We'll see a little bit of that when we talk about paper money, the move away from gold. I think yeah, it's it is. a religious sense. That's why I said it. Yeah, it is religious. The original one was the no, it was Adam. Because he, his neighbor picked an apple and it gave it back. Mm -hmm. And that turned into evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing started from there. Well, it is a very religious concept. It's a very mystical religious view of, of, of the, what this world is like. And then what he wants to do is have salvation by getting rid of the evilness of itself. <laughs> okay, um, another question, anybody? You guys with me? Yeah. Carry on. Carry on. If money is stored in it, you then it's a slave anyway. Yeah. 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 That's what he's saying. Well, it's something he's purchasing power, and you buy things with money, you've got power with it. The power originally came from, from somebody producing all of it first place. Well, let's see if we can show what happens in this capital accumulation. First part that goes on is a, is a section wealth and misery. Capital, one part of that is the wealth. Capital becomes more concentrated, more centralized. Fewer and fewer capitalists control more and more wealth. This is part of his model of capitalism. Accumulation therefore presents itself on the one hand as increasing concentration of the means of production and the command over labor. This concentration of capitals already formed, destruction of the individual independence, expropriation of capitalists by capitalists, transformation of many small into few large capitals. Capital grows in one place to a huge mass in a single hand because it has in another place been lost by many. This is centralization proper as distinct from accumulation and concentration. We don't need to go into the difference between concentration and centralization, but he's capitals growing. In, 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 a, in getting more concentrated at the same time. At the same time that this is supposed to go on, and this is a, one of the areas where you can contend, you can critique Marx imperially, capital has not concentrated over the last hundred years. In the United States, the measures of capital concentration have been, in fact, the hard thing to explain is that it's been constant since World War I, the, the dispersion of wealth. It hasn't grown and it hasn't gotten dispersed. It's just been there. And um, that's a hard one to explain why, but it hasn't. You don't see it getting more and more concentrated. Um, it wouldn't like more than sense. Hmm? Like well, it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The only way that, that you can see that capital might be concentrating more and more if you add the state to the capital in a Marxist analysis and say it's concentrating by the state now is this sort of state capitalist system controlling more and more and more wealth, you know. That type of thing. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a book that I have called uh, Takeovers and Mergers. It's a major. Uh, yeah, but empirically, empirically, there is not more concentration. The studies are all over there. States or in the states? In the states. Now, in this country, I, I think there's been more concentration here, but you've got problems here with the inability of capital flow in and out. So you've got a tendency here internally, and you also have a very concentrated government here that controls a lot. Now they, now they own bits, too, so mm -hmm. bit by bit, you know. Did you that, that would Marxists would say that's part of the capitalist system. Here's the state taking over bits, you know. Did you excluding the international basis, because that's what's happening now. No, even There's in a book money mandarin, usually. Oh, I've, I've read a fair amount of this, and it, you can go back and forth, but the capitalist concentration, I, I don't think, can be empirically shown. I'm not comfortable with that, but a lot of people try and do it. They talk about the multinationals taking over the world, but this is where it comes from. This is that can argument. Give you information on that. Okay. Um, Wait, what is this? What's this mechanism here? Just we'll get to it. No. That's the crisis. We'll get to it. In the economic crisis, there's going to be a crash. Workers, are going, uh, industrials go bankrupt. The bank will pick up the pieces. You see, that's the whole economic system. Uh, the position of the wor well, there's a lot in here that's of interest. The position of the worker worsens. Wages may rise, and he talks about how wages may rise. Living standards may be up for the worker, but they fall relative to the rise in surplus value. In other words, wages may go up from three rand to four rand, but surplus value is going to go up from five rand to eight rand, or something like that. That is, the relative position of the workers will become worse and worse. He's not necessarily talking about them all <laughs> starving, but they, they get more and more and more exploited. Labor becomes more divided and more alienated. Within the capitalist system, all methods for raising the social productiveness of labor are brought at the cost of the individual laborer. Why are Marxists would be upset with speed-up programs in companies, how to make workers work more efficient. They say it's making them more exploitive. 
All means for the development of production transform themselves into means of domination over and exploitation of the producers, i.e. the workers. They mutilate the laborer into a fragment of a man, degrade him to the level of an appendage of a machine, destroy every remnant of charm in his work, and turn it into hated toil. They estrange from him the intellectual potentialities of the labor process, they distort the condition under which he works, they transform his lifetime into working time, and drag his wife and child beneath the wheels of the juggernaut of capital. It follows, therefore, he's fun, he's writing his fun. <laughs> it follows, therefore, that in proportion as capital accumulates, the lot of the laborer, be his payment high or low, could be high, must grow worse. The law establishes an accumulation of misery corresponding with the accumulation of capital. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is therefore at the same time accumulation of misery, agony, of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation at the opposite pole. Would you say it's the food that no. workers are, uh, the masses are richer than they ever were before yeah. the capital system. It's dead wrong. But I, I think they're, uh, they're getting richer in, in absolute terms at a bigger, bigger percentage. Uh, yeah, in relative terms, the workers are getting richer too. Yeah. And in this country, as this country develops, I would pre one prediction I would make is that the percentage of national income that goes to labor will go up. It won't go down. It'll go up. Until you get to studying the current ecological position. Well, this isn't, we're not on ecology here. It's not in the modern Marxist model. Marx has no theory of ecology. I'm talking about that. The, the theory that he's trying to say is that as capitalism evolves, the workers will get relatively more worse off. And actually, I think it's the other way around. Workers have gotten richer and richer. Yeah. So he's so saying that they get richer, they get more miserable as they get richer. Yeah, supposedly they get more miserable. So they more TV systems. Maybe they do. Maybe you could play that argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's they don't have to get more miserable. Pardon me? Not all of the world lives on the capitalist systems, that's why. The, the countries that have opened up the market to the people, I would think, then the people are rich. Switzerland, the United States, or Germany, Japan, those parts of South Africa that allow capitalism to work. Taiwan. That's, that's my view. You know, I don't support Marx's view of the world, but yeah, I don't see it. You can't divide a country like South Africa up. I mean, it's a single unit. It is and it isn't. There are it that, that has been politically divided up, so it's tough. Some parts don't have the flow that other parts do, of capital, of access, you know, access to owning factories and areas that you can get decent infrastructure, things like that. Um, you still, capitalism doesn't guarantee that everybody will be rich. It creates the opportunities for wealth. The United States, we have poverty, too. We have a lot of poverty still in the United States, but we have a lot of wealth, massive amounts of wealth. Now the average, the average worker in, a, in an automobile company in the states makes with um, what, with his um, compensation, his insurance programs, his pension programs, and so on, makes about forty thousand dollars a year. It's not bad. We're working in an automobile factory, and that's a guy on the floor. They, they will have ten children, and they also have squatters around them. Well, the children thing, you know, the forty thousand, you can, you can ten maybe now, but you can have a bunch of kids with that. The kids aren't a problem if the kids work well. You know, that's if, you know, a lot of these people that are like that are, and, and at least in the areas I come from, the Chicago families tend to have big kids. I was raised Catholic. Well, you know, we didn't have 10, we had five. My mother got tired after five. I was a <laughs> <laughs> But well, I grew up with a lot of friends of mine that had 10 kids that were Catholic, and that didn't affect them because kids all work. You know, paperboys. They, they could afford to have 10 children. Well, they made the kids work. Right, right. There's, there's something going on still in this room. There are people who have an emotional view of the world that things are getting worse. And they need that view. And, uh, well, you and I disagree with them, but they're going to keep Well, that. things, things right. are getting worse in some parts. Well, that's a huge thing. I think yeah. I think things are, I don't see things are getting, things get worse and better and worse and better. Yeah. I think that's how I see the world. It's, it's a constant it's But I, yeah, I see if you look at the development of market economies from the time Marx is writing this in the 1860s to now the 1980s, those countries that have had this exploitive system tend to be pretty well off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with what you said. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to uh, look at it overall when you finish it. Yeah. But probably exploitation is a good thing for the workers because they get the wealth back. It, 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 it sort of goes a full circle. Now, 
no, you can if post the capital them. make them work harder than they would normally in order to, to uh, get wealth, and then this wealth comes back onto the workers because the capitalists spend the wealth and expand, and uh, there's more work. That's no, no, I agree. Now, this is like it's like the word we said earlier alienation. Alienation is a tyranny, or exploitation is another way of talking about that. It's efficiency. So it's not necessarily bad if you look at it from a, a different viewpoint. It's just efficient use of your resources. Um, okay, but Marx says on top of this that there will be a growing mass of unemployed workers. So not only are the workers going to become relatively worse off, there's more and more people going to be put out of work. Read it here. Hang on. The greater the social wealth, the functioning capital, the extent and energy of its growth, and therefore also the absolute mass of the proletariat and the productiveness of its labor, the greater is the industrial reserve army. They get put out of work basically due to technological improvements, capital intensive programs, and so on. The workers get thrown out of work. Uh, Marx's view, that's not necessarily a problem because these are the people that are going to be, you know, angry and have the revolution. He's not, he doesn't necessarily do one, which is what he wants. So he, he, he says this is what's going to happen. Again, I don't think that's empirically verifiable. We don't see increases in unemployment over the last 100 years. You see periods where it's up and down, but we don't see any continual growth in unemployment in, in the capitalist countries. But according to Marx, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Do you think observations of either way is it just speculation? Have you ever observed any of this taking place? He attempted to observe it um, with what was going on, but he was basically speculating here, this is what's going to happen. And see, this is fine for him because what he's seen is a concentration of wealth into a small group and an immiseration of the masses. And so he's seen setting up a stage where these masses will then just throw out these bums and take over the system. It's going to be a few people to off, you know, just knock out a few bankers and we're done with it. Yeah. Yeah. He, does, he does cite some statistics to support his position, uh, which is basically from the so-called Hungary 40s, when mm -hmm. indeed the poor were getting poorer and unemployment was growing for a relatively short period of time. Right? He's big then what happens is any rice uh, does copy cells, and then three, uh, 20 to three editions. Now all the statistics in the subsequent editions are updated, except the labor statistics, because they okay. disproved Marx. Uh, so there was selective uh, updating. Yes, that's and Marx, in fact, abandoned dust copy cells and never finished it. And one theory as to why he never finished in fact, abandoned economics. Yeah. He, he stopped dealing with the UN and studied maths and astronomy. <laughs> and politics. He was a UN and yeah. politics. He, he, he actually abandoned yeah. the subject entirely, but, but by the time the second and third editions came out, the empirical evidence, which he was observing and monitoring very well, he was actually he was very good at this, uh, went against everything it said, so he just ignored it. Mm. Yeah, yes, people have done that. There's two things that have gone on there. One is that they Look, taken the data that he was following, pulled it up to the 60s, 18, uh, 60s, 1870s. And another thing that's actually been done is people have gone out and found out that he forged data too. Yes. That he, he actually took data and changed the numbers to make his point in his books. He, he, just, he just cheated. Because <laughs> he couldn't find data that worked, so he just made it up. He cited the references of obscure journals and people from back and found out he was wrong mm -hmm. in his data. In the time he was writing, can one say that uh, his, his thinking was the result of the Industrial Revolution. Sure, he was in the Industrial Revolution, yeah. yeah. Because of, the, of, of all the change, tremendous change that was taking place and all the uproar that was caused. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's a period, when you look at his sections of money and banking, which is, I, I have another partial theory why he abandoned um, his work, and that is because it just overwhelmed him. He started, and we'll see, he looks at a lot of banking interest rates, and this stuff is just coming out. Checking accounts. Um, I don't know if it's, I can't remember if this time or next time we talk a little bit about the Bank of England and fraction reserve banking, and this stuff is very new and developing. The corporation and the can, um, conglomerations and all, conglomerates and all this is all just coming out. So he's trying to understand something that's at the cutting edge of it. So there's just there was so much there. I think that's right. The feeling I get is it just sort of it just got more and more complicated and just got embroiled in this this cobweb of, of theories and he just despairs. Yeah. In fact, he just sort of throws up his arms and basically says I can't deal with yeah. this and mm -hmm. repairs him to the into the British Museum to study something else. Yeah, and he does and but and but he
but he gives up at a key point, and what we're going to pull out here in the rest of the night's talk is an attempt to show what he's trying to do is to show business cycle theory of how the system is unstable. But people usually don't pick up on it. They pick up on alienation and, and exploitation. Those are the big key terms, you know, and then that's it. And they come up and they talk about this immiseration of the working class, and then you're done with it. What we're actually moving into now is trying to look at more of his theories of how the institutions of capitalism work, and what an interest rate is, what credit is, what money is, and so on. And a lot of this comes out from these fragments of things that he never ties together. But some of it, I think, is just brilliant. So even though I disagree with his pre prediction of where capitalism is going, I think he does a have a very interesting argument on the instability of capitalism, and one that if one is uh, supportive of capitalism, they have to deal with whether or not capitalism is a stable system or not. And I mean free market capitalism without central government intervention, pure capitalism. Well, Marx was, at the time when he was able to observe the, the effects of the land and pleasure acts, mm -hmm. which in those days was almost the equivalent of our squatter camps of today, where the people were moving away from the villages and into the towns. And arising out of that, the poverty and the child labor, etc. And having seen that, he possibly formulated Sure. He, he sees an industrial reserve army coming out of enclosures and talks about that, about the, the, that whole movement, um, and um, sees that as, if you will, the basis of it. But now it's going to be, once you get capitalism going, it doesn't have to do with the land anymore. It has to do with machinery and technology squeezing people out. But it forms with that. That's where your original pro working class group comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, when does it say under this uh, scheme of exploitation, I think it's Oh, he could. I, a lot of what he says on exploitation is, you can see it. You can, especially in this situation here, because you've got a mass of unemployed or unemployed people in this country. And you've got people that are working in near subsistence wages and so on. And so the, the Marxian description fits very well for a lot of the economy here. Uh, so we did it at the uh, wage discrimination and job reservations. Right. And see. The full advantage is directed one day, not quite tomorrow. But um, the, 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 this gets back when you say things like job reservation and so on. This gets back to the statement I was trying to say earlier about state versus capitalism. Somebody who supports capitalism would be opposed to job reservation. A libertarian would be and say that that's wrong. It's an imposition. Or a Marxist would see job reservation as the, the capitalists using the state as a means to exploit workers. And so they would say that job reservation is part of the capitalist system. But a libertarian would say, no, that's an imposition put on it by racial socialism on the, on the part of the central government. So there are different views of what this whole thing's about. But Marx would say, oh, yeah, look at this. This is a perfect example of exploitation. There's an assumption that you and the Marxists make, which is that job reservation is exploitation of black labor. It's in fact the prohibition of exploiting black labor. Right. What job reservation says is you may not exploit black labor. Yeah, you keep one down a lot of hiring. Yeah, you can't bring them into hiring. But you keep them at lower levels, you maintain, I guess. Well, well, job reservation says well, you may exploit only whites. You can only bring them into the factory. And, and since Marxists regard job reservation as good for whites, they have a explain in yeah. what way it's good for whites to allow capitalists to exploit them and to prevent capitalists exploiting blacks. Yeah, exploiting blacks. <laughs> <laughs> according, to, according to Marx's yeah, theory, okay. job Thanks. reservation should be good for blacks. Yeah. Well, well, uh, out of I, I think that's because uh, uh, the interpretation here, yeah, because Whites an opportunity to hold certain jobs. Mm -hmm. Yes, but according to Marx, uh, that yeah. means they're being exploited. Because they're working. Well, uh, Only uh, workers uh, are exploited. Uh, architects and stuff, but the ones have learned it from him and called better to the fit. Yes, yes, absolutely. But originally. That's why I say for a group was a Leninist. Because <laughs> <laughs> originally, job reservation was to, to, to protect the white workers against exploitation by the people who employed. Uh, because they were bringing in low-paid black workers, they weren't try trying to increase, increase the, uh, improve the, the situation of the black workers. They were trying to break down the position of the white workers, protect the white workers. 
No, oh, they were yeah. trying to break down the white workers, and as a result Maybe of the strike capitalism, it, 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 it just developed. It gets to bring about order. It gets complicated to try and apply it into the present world. But I think Marx would have said that he would have yeah. wanted the black workers to be hired to be exploited, so that they would then become a working class and throw over the system. Now, Mar for example, Marx is opposed to slavery. He was very much on the side of the North and against the South because he wanted to get beyond the feudal system to the capitalist system. Capitalism is necessary. You had to exploit workers. To s you had to create the wealth, exploit the workers, and then the workers will come together and create the revolution. You know? So he, he would, I think he would want you know, he would want to let the workers get exploited, if that makes sense, because that's necessary. It's part of history. And job reservation is holding back history, if you will, not letting these workers get any uh, Yes, I mean, this is important. Marx believes that the free market is desirable and necessary. Yeah. He Marx. wants it. Oh, yeah. The consequence of it is that the workers get exploited and form and, and rebel. Excluding blacks from being exploited, according to Marx, should be in the short-term interests of blacks, the, the job reservation. But it's in the long-term interest, of, against their long-term interest, because it, it prevents them from wanting to, uh, from getting working class consciousness and uh, joining the revolution. It prevents the country from In other words, you're saying exploitation is a good thing. Marx says well, it's a necessary evil. Marx says it's a necessary evil. What about survival then? What about the blacks who are, who are not able to survive? Now you see, this is why I say job reservation is a problem for Marxists. Because according to them you are better off if you are not being employed. Uh, as Walter Williams says, uh, uh, you, you, you protect workers from exploitation by throwing them out of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can push on to um, the series on interest. This is fun, isn't it? <laughs> fun stuff. Huh? Yeah, it's good stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. um, he, he deals a lot with the fact that capital appears to have a return on its own, that there's a return to capital. Of course, Marx says it really isn't a return because it's based on labor. All value comes from labor. Since living labor, through the exchange between capital and labor, is incorporated in capital and appears as activity belonging to capital from the moment that the labor process begins. All the productive powers of social labor appears as the productive powers of capital, just as the general social form of labor appears in money as the property of a thing. In other words, capital seems to have value, but its value really comes from labor. The value that we talk about with capital is gross profit or surplus value. This is this relationship between capital and labor is where it comes from. The basic division of value is between gross profit and wages. Is uh, sufficient uh, sufficiency wages for the workers to keep them alive versus everything else. That's your first division. The next divisions come beyond that. The next divisions is how do we divide this gross profit or surplus value? I'm using the term gross profit. He uses the term surplus value into what one could call industrial profit, interest, and rent. So. The surplus value gets divided into profit, interest, and rent. Industrial profit or entrepreneurial profit, if you want. And he explains that these categories are only different names for different parts of the surplus value or of the unpaid labor enclosed in it. So there's just parts of it. Okay. The key division is between interest and industrial profit. Uh, interest and profit, if you will, modern terms of profit. And this is the split between the bankers and the industrialists how they, the struggle between the capital, the two sections of capitalists. Rent's in there, but rent plays a, a minor role. It's a, it's a less important role in his system than the interest and profit. And interest, the struggle between interest and profit moves his, into his model of, of economic instability, so I emphasize that. Money capitalists and industrial capitalists can form two particular classes only because profit is capable of separating off into two branches of revenue. But in order that two such classes may come to confront one another, the double existence presupposes a divergence within the surplus value posited by capital. So now we not only have the capitalist class and the proletariat class, we now have a split capitalist class, industrialists versus bankers. The industrialist share of capital is the reward for productively employing labor and capital. It's pure entrepreneurial profit. 
The portion of profits which falls to his share necessarily assumes the form of industrial or commercial profit, or to use a German term embracing both, the form of unter, Unternehmergewinn, profit of enterprise. We turn to entrepreneurship, is what a modern free marketeer would say. But the industrial, so that's what the industrial gets. The industrialist works for the bankers. They work with borrowed capital. And out of this relationship comes interest. Interest is the relationship between the industrialist and the, and the banker. The part of the profit paid to the owner is called interest, which is just another name or special term for part of the profit given up by capital in the process of functioning to the owner of capital instead of putting it into its own pocket. So do you have this, this distinction in between the owners of capital and the users of capital? Um, Interest is the payment of bankers for the privilege of working with their capital. Interest appears as a value completely alienated and unrelated to its true source. Its true source is labor. Labor produces value, but now we've got this interest payment between two capitalist classes that's totally out there. It has nothing to do with the workers anymore. But all it is is alienated labor that's out there being bandied around between the, the bankers mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, um, and the industrialists. Interest presents capital not in opposition to labor, but on the contrary, is having no relation to labor, <coughs> and merely as the relation of one capitalist to another. <coughs> Consequently, is a category which is quite extrinsic to and independent of the relation of capital to labor. The rate of interest can fluctuate between zero and one. What determines the rate of interest is the competition among the capitalists, the bargaining power between the industrialists and the bankers. The rate of interest has absolutely no role to play when it comes to productivity and time preference. Modern capitalist theorists have two views of the rate of interest. The rate of interest either reflects <coughs> the productivity of capital, it as like it's a payment to capital, like wages, a payment to labor, or the one that I follow is that the interest rate reflects time preference. In other words, consumers' preference for present consumption versus future consumption. So we sit down and we say, which would you rather have, 100 rand a day or 100 rand in a year from now? And you say, I'd rather have 100 rand a day. Then I say, you believe in interest. I do this to my Muslim students in the States all the time because Muslims don't believe in interest. And I, they say, and I, and I say, I say, okay, 100 rand a day or 110 rand a year from now. And they go 100 rand a day. I go 100 rand, 120. And they say, okay, I'll take the 120. And I say, you believe in a 20% interest rate. That's your time <laughs> preference. No, no, we don't believe in interest. It's against our religion. And so we get back and forth on this. But that's, that's time preference theory of interest rate. Marx, and it, so the interest rate is a mechanism that's used in modern capitalist theory to equilibrate production and consumption over time. The interest rate is what smooths out the production process. It tells us how much of our effort should be put into supplying current needs versus future needs. In Marx, it doesn't have any allocated function at all. The interest is just a bar comes out of a bargaining power between two capitalist classes. One of the reasons that modern-day Marxists have a very low appreciation of the role of interest rates in, in, in an economic system. They throw them out. Okay. In interest, Marx sees everything that's in fault in capitalism. Interest also embodies all these evils. It's the special expression of the contradictory character of capital. It is the manifestation of the mystification of capital in its extreme form. Thus, interest sums up the alienated character of the conditions of labor in relation to the activity of the subject. It represents the ownership of capital or mere capital property as a means for appropriating the products of other people's labor, as a control over other people's labor. In interest and in rent, we have the complete mystification of the capitalist mode of production, the conversion of social relations into things, the direct coalescence of the material production relations with their historical and social determination. It is an exchange perverted, topsy-turvy world in which Monsieur Le Capitard and Madame Le Terre do their ghost rocking as social characters and at the same time directly as mere things. So the system is just perverse, all this value floating around in these odd things like called interest rates. Then it has no allocative or coordinating role in the economy. In practical commerce, capitalist A can screw capitalist B. The proportion, just or unjust, in which they distribute the surplus value among themselves alters nothing about exchange or about the exchange relation between capital and labor. It, does, it has no real essence meaning in the economy. Marx ends up on this theory of interest, and he criticizes socialists that attack interest, specifically Padun. Um, he says about Padun, 
Altogether, his criticism is that of a novice. He has not mastered the first elements of the science he intends to criticize. Cartoon does not understand how profit and consequently interests as well arise from the law of exchange values. Now, interest is a, sub, it's a secondary issue. The primary issue is the creation of surplus value. Interest is next. So you can't get rid of capitalism by abolishing interest. That's not the way to do it. Marx wants to get rid of interest, too. But wanting to preserve wage labor and thus the basis of capital, as Perdue does, <coughs> and at the same time to eliminate the drawbacks by abolishing a secondary form of capital reveals the novice. You don't get rid of capitalism by abolishing interest rates. You get rid of capitalism by abolishing wage labor. Interest must be abolished along with it. Exchange, this is me, exchange and competition, wages and profits, money and capital must be abolished. Marx proposes to wipe out the entire capitalist order. Interest is just a part of it. Okay. Um, let's just, we'll do credit here and then we'll take a break. From interest, you go to credit, and credit is, is going to become crucial to understanding this, this model of economic instability. Credit is a necessary part of capitalism. The credit system becomes a new and formidable weapon in the competition struggle and finally transforms itself into an immense social mechanism for the centralization of capital. Credit's a key word, and um, Leon was talking about the areas where he gets quits writing. A lot of this is on his credit theories, and, and where he gets tired, and he can't figure it out. So the third volume of capital is little blips here, and little blips here, and little blips here of, of ideas and insights. And what you've got here is my, at least my judgment of what he's trying to say. Um, bankers emerge as a ruling class in the capitalist mode. What bankers do is they uh, create credit. I call it artificial credit creation. Bankers can create credit out of thin air. Marx observes this fact from the tendency for credit creation not backed by existing money capital. Fractional reserve banking spontaneously evolves within the capitalist order. And fractional reserve banking basically means that if I put 100 rand in the standard bank, Standard Bank can lend out more than 100 grand. It doesn't just lend out what I put into it. It lends out more than that. If you have a reserve requirement of 20%, that means that Standard Bank is required to keep 20% on reserve, and it can lend out 80%. So it can lend out 80 grand. Okay, the way it lends out 80 grand is it opens up an account for somebody else. So now somebody else has a current account with 80 grand in it. Now that it has that 80 grand, it's required to keep 20% of that on reserve and it can lend out another 80%. So it puts 16 Rand down and lends out 64 Rand. So from the first 100 Rand, now it's lent out 80 and 64. It's already lent out more than 100 Rand. Well, now that 64 Rand, it keeps 20%, lends out 80%, and so on and so on. And eventually what you get is for 100 Rand, 20% reserve requirement, it can make 500 Rand of credit. It's one over 20%. How much money goes into the bank and how much actually comes 100 Rand in, 500 Rand out. No, no, 500 rand of credit goes out. Purchasing power, they were, yeah, they all, you borrow money, they lend you. Money. No, no, more than 100 spent, 500 spent. They borrow the money. The banks lend more money than they bring in. They create, they artificially create credit out of thin air, purchasing power. No, they can just, in the doctrine, first year principles <coughs> of economics, that's how the whole system works. It's called fraction reserve banking. And what the reserve bank does, is it regulates the reserve requirements and all that. But that's how it works. Pardon me? That's how much it's, yeah, it's how, what the, what, whether it's 20% that they have to keep on reserve, 16% or whatever. In the States, it's about 16. I don't know what it is here. But that's how the whole system works. It's a fraction <coughs> reserve banking. They lend out, they create money out of thin air. Um, in other words, this is where you start to look about when you're examining inflation. Yeah. You start to. Yeah, you start to look at it, and you look at... Um, the creation of money in the banks and the creation with the reserve system. But he's, he's more concerned here not with inflation, but with the creation of credit. No, I was concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that this, is, this is what he's concerned about, is well, credit, the, the creation of the ability to buy labor power created out of thin air, credit that's just made up. Instead of a paper note, the bank may open a credit account for A. This is good stuff. This is, I mean, this could be put in a first year principles course in economics. Instead of a paper note, the bank may open a credit account for A, in which case this A, the bank's debtor, becomes its imaginary depositor. He pays his creditors with checks in the bank, and the recipient of these checks passes them on to his banker, who exchanges them for <coughs> checks outstanding against him in the clearinghouse. So you've got, if you want to think about it, I 
put 100 rand in the standard bank, they lend 80 rand to somebody, that person puts his in first national, and so on. So it works for the system that way. Everybody's lending everybody else. With, with the development of interest-bearing capital in the credit system, all capital seems to double itself, and sometimes triple itself by the various modes in which the same capital, or perhaps even the same claim on a debt, appears in different forms in different hands. The greater portion of this money capital is purely fictitious, all the deposits, with the exception of the reserve fund, are merely claims in the banks, which, however, never exist as deposits. That's pretty straightforward, how the banking system works. Why hmm? did you write it with the reserve fund gold and silver? Mm -hmm. the gold, it was gold and silver there in the Bank of England. And we, we'll talk about central banking next week, but it's the reserve fund is gold. Mm. And what's the reserve fund today? Nothing. Nothing. Trust in the government. That's Nothing. all it is. Yeah. So, so the whole thing is circular. What, what, I don't know how it works in this country, but in the United States, the major asset of our Federal Reserve System is U.S. government debt. So what backs all the money is debt. Debt backs, debt backs, debt. The whole yeah. thing is a debt system. Uh, so that's that's one debt. reason why they're the biggest debt country in the world. Well, they're, they're also good. They pay their bills. That's one of the reasons they're big debt. They're all the prisons you pay. They always have. 200 years. They're very good debtors. Um, the United States has never defaulted. And so it's a good place it's to invest your money. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the best track record of any major enterprise growing today. Um, okay, the fraction reserve banking enables loan capital to exceed real capital. An accumulation of loan capital can take place without any accumulation, that is, by mere technical means, such as an expansion or concentration of the banking system. Credit expansion also emerges as the mode by which capitalist contradictions evolve into economic crises. By means of the banking system, the distribution of capital as a special business, a social function, is taken out of the hands of the private capitalists and users. But at the same time, banking and credit thus become the most potent means of driving capitalist production beyond its own limits, and one of the most effective vehicles of crisis is swindle. And the credit system appears as the main lever of overproduction and overspeculation in commerce solely because the reproduction process, which is elastic by nature, is here forced to its extreme limits and is so forced because a large part of the social capital is employed by people who do not own it, who consequently take things quite differently than the owner, who actually weighs the limitation of his private capital insofar as he handles it himself. The banker, in a way, is a capitalist gone mad. <laughs> This simply de demonstrates the fact that the self-expansion of capital based on the contradictory nature of capitalist production permits an actual free development only up to a certain point, so that in fact it constitutes an imminent fetter and barrier to production, which in fact is continually broken through by the credit system. If it wasn't for the credit system, capitalism could only expand by the amount of capital that's there. The credit system puts 500 rand in instead of 100 rand and forces the system to go out, of, out of, to blow up, to, to expand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hence, the credit system accelerates the material development of the productive forces and the establishment of the worldwide market. At the same time, credit accelerates the violent eruptions of this contradiction crisis. And my last line there is: credit creation is the Achilles heel of capitalism. That's yeah. that's that's what causes the problems. Okay, why don't we take a break and we'll come back and talk about crises. Can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. Okay. What about the, the, the employment of people? That helps to employ people. Well, it employs people, but it employs people to produce things that nobody wants. We'll get to that. <laughs> this one's out of whack. We'll see. Let's see the credit. <laughs> Economic <laughs> These are books that you've got. I've got a book on this. Yeah. Which is um, the, well, we're going to try and describe here, and I've got a lot of fragmented quotes that I'll go through, is Marx's attempt to explain why capitalist systems expand, contract, expand, contract. Why there's a business cycle. And as I said, he's one of the first major thinkers business cycle theory, he's trying to say he's the godfather of macroeconomics. There are two views to economic crisis theory. There's the overproduction view and the underconsumption view. Many Underconsumption means that things crash because people don't consume enough, insufficient demand for products. 
the overconsumption view says things crash because there's produce, people produce too much. Uh, you can get both models in Marx, both views, because he wrote loads and loads and loads of stuff on this. I, my own feeling is that the, mo the model that makes sense, the model that's more, most powerful, is Marx's overproduction model, his model of, of crisis brought about by an expansion of capital. This model is now very popular with a school of economics called the Austrian School of Economics. And if one was to read the works of Friedrich von Hayek or Ludwig von Mises, you'd see the same, virtually the same model as in Marx. Um, the Austrians argue that the crisis is brought about by central banking, by state and monopoly control of the banking system. Marx has a different view of what brings it about. But the actual process is very similar. Um, so actually what, what I'm giving you here, this is what I did my doctoral dissertation on, was to argue that the Austrians and the Marxists have, and Marx have very similar views of economic crises. And uh, so it's a, sort of some heavy stuff to go through. We're going to start off by looking at Say's Law. Then we're going to look at the boom of, of, a, of a neat business cycle, then the crash, and then finally I'll, I'll mention on whether or not the bankers are running this system or not. Say's Law is important. This is the basis of this whole thing. but. J.B. Say was a French economist, very popular economist of his day, wrote in about 1800, had a strong influence, wrote in the late 1700s, too, had a strong influence on the founding fathers in the United States who read a lot of, of the United States um, government, who read a lot of their economics in French and read J.B. Say. Marx can't stand this guy. Let me give you an idea about what he says. He calls Say dull, insipid, vulgar, insane, tedious, that miserable individual, this humbug, this comical prince de la science. Say's law, which we'll get to, he can't stand at all. He calls it Say's error, this trash of Say, Say's trite assumption, the rigmarole of Say, the childish babble of Say, a childish argument, the absurdity of J.B. Say, the vulgarization of Adam Smith. The Say is a vulgar economist as far as Marx is concerned. Say's law is developed in his book, A Treatise of Political Economy, the summary statement is supply creates its own demand. Supply-side economists today, people like um, Laffer, uh, Jack Kemp, the representative who calls himself a supply-sider, are followers of J.B. Say. They say, basically, in order to demand something, you have to produce something first. Makes good sense. And that, furthermore, that every act of production brings with it an act of consumption. Every supply brings with it a demand. The market balances based on the supply leading the system. I've, there's a long quote there. I won't read this whole quote by Say. This is not Marx's Say on the top of page 9, but I'll read a few lines in it. You say you only want money, and I say you want other commodities and not money. Sales cannot be said to be dull because money is scarce, but because other products are so. We don't demand for money, according to J.P. Say. We demand for Consumption. Consumption's the base. A product is no sooner created than it from that instant affords a market for other products to the full extent of its own value. And the last line, thus the mere circumstance of the creation of one product immediately opens a bend for other products. Now this is a very controversial paragraph. There has been volumes written on this whole notion. There's one article I read about J.B. Say's eight laws, eight different interpretations of what he means, and so on. Mm -hmm. I did probably a, a good year of work in graduate school just trying to understand what this is all about. Basically what's at the base of it is that J.B. Say is contending that markets are stable, that we cannot supply a product to a market that's worth anything unless we're also demanding something from the market. We supply the demand. Everything is working on a micro level that we're producing goods and consuming goods, and the whole market is in balance. Marx is saying, no, the market isn't stable, it isn't in balance, it's chaotic, it's anarchistic, J.B. Say is wrong, capitalism is a mess. He's, he's, and he's, and I, as I say here, his critique of Say is the basis of his economic crisis theory. He starts by looking at the people that support capitalism and, and attacking them, and then he builds his model out of that. He starts early on, he says, it wishes, critiquing the Say Ricardo score, he says, it wishes to see only useful things produced but forgets that production of too many useful things produces too large of a useless population. That if his problem is that the system may overproduce, quote, useful things, the things that people want. 
He leads it in James Mill. James Mill is the father of John Stuart Mill, who also is big on Slave's Law. And James Mill's formula is that, quote, and this is from Marx, supply equals its own demand, that supply and demand therefore balance is an ingenious expression of his nonsense about the impossibility of overproduction. He doesn't think it's nonsense. He's very upset with Ricardo. Marx loves Ricardo as his hero. Ricardo's your true capitalist thinker, but he's very upset with him for supporting Slave's Law. He says, this is a childish babble say, but it is not worthy of Ricardo. Okay, to show that the capitalist order is internally unstable and prone to crisis, Marx must discredit Slave's Law. <coughs> Quote, in every industry, each individual capitalist produces in proportion to his capital, irrespective of the needs of society, and especially irrespective of the supply of competing capitalists in the same industry. So he's already there arguing that capitalists are not producing in a coordinated fashion. They're just producing there. Markets are not means of coordination. And <coughs> quite explicit, this is a direct attack of free market theories here. Markets are not means of coordination. They are institutions of contradiction. It is the contradiction of capitalism that generates overproduction the basic phenomenon of crisis. Okay. Capitalists produce to make a profit, not to supply a demand. Prof it's the reason for capitalism is to make money, generate surplus value, not to meet the needs of customers. You're not meeting customers' needs. Profits come from exploiting workers. They do not come from the successful coordination of production with consumption. Your free marketeers will say profit comes from you know, doing a good job coordinating demanders and suppliers. No, Marx profits came from exploiting laborers. That's where it comes from. In the first place, no capitalist produces in order to consume his product. In the situation where men produce for themselves, there are indeed no crises, but neither is there capitalist production. If we produce for ourselves, then we're not capitalists. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Um, what comes out of this then is we're going to go money to credit. The existence of money is tantamount to the invalid validity of Say's law. Once you have money, Purchase and sale are separated. Money allows the separation of sale and purchase. Because of money, current supply need not create current demand. Because of money, you can pay me to give this lecture. I can put the money in my wallet and not buy anything. So therefore, my decision to sell a product is not immediately connected with my decision to buy a product. And Marx is now saying that creates a gulf, a gap. And that gap is what's going to bring about a possibility for crises. Nothing is more absurd as a means of denying crises than the assertion that the consumers, buyers, and the producers, sellers, are identical in capitalist production. They're entirely distinct categories. To buy is different than to sell. They're different people, different activities. The general nature of the metamorphosis of commodities, which includes the separation of purchase and sale, just as it does in unity, instead of excluding the possibility of a general glut, on the contrary, it contains the possibility of a general glut. Although circulation of money can occur without crises, crises cannot occur without circulation of money. Crises exist because it's a monetary system. Money is it behind it. The possibility of crises is once more demonstrated and further developed by the disjunction between the direct process of production and the process of circulation. The process of circulation is the market, trade. As soon as these processes do not merge smoothly into, into one another, in other words, as soon as the business is producing are not coordinated with the buying and selling of goods, but become independent of one another, the crisis is there if the system's out of whack. Okay. Say's law is put forth as a logical proof that overproduction is impossible. If what Say is saying is in an unhampered market process, there, is, there can be gluts of particular commodities at particular prices. In other words, you can have a surplus of whatever, jam, or you can have a surplus of milk, or you can have a surplus of red tackies, but you can't have a surplus of everything at once. There, what says is saying there cannot be a general glut, general overproduction. Marx says no, there can be a general glut, a general overproduction of goods, specifically capital goods. So does this mean warehouses all over the place? Warehouses, incomplete buildings, we'll get to it, yeah. Warehouses, not, they don't have to necessarily be finished goods. Goods and process is what they mostly are. They're both partly right. No, this is not, uh, this stuff is, I, I, this part of Marx I think is real powerful. What causes it is going to be a question, but his understanding of, of economic crisis I think is really super. I don't think it builds on the other stuff. He, he's trying to make it build on it, but it's, 
it's, it's, I, I, but it, it's very interesting, I really think. His critique of, he, he attacks say and says, and moreover, Monsignor say teaches sluggishness in the style of some products arises from the scarcity of some others. Therefore, there can never be too many tables produced, but at most perhaps too few dishes to be put on the tables. If physicians increase too much in number, what is wrong is not that their services are available in superfluity, but perhaps that the services of other producers of immaterial products are in short supply, for example, prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's his sort of view of this thing. Marx, re Marx rejects price adjustment and market clearing explanations for the impossibility of a spontaneous capitalist crisis. In other words, um, he's arguing that capitalism will not <coughs> automatically adjust. Between the starting point, the prerequisite of capital, and the time of its return, at the end of one of these periods, great catastrophes must occur and elements of crisis must have gathered and developed. These cannot in any way be dismissed by the pitiful proposition that products exchange for products. Anarchist production in search of surplus value generates the overproduction of commodities. It comes about because people are looking for surplus value. So they're out there trying to produce more and more and more. Overproduction is inherent in capitalism. His quote, he says, the market expands more slowly than production, or in the cycle through which capital passes during its reproduction, there comes a moment in which the market manifests itself as too narrow for production. In other words, production is outstripping the market. This occurs at the end of the cycle, but it merely means the market is flooded, overproduction is manifest. In Marx's model, what you get is investment exceeds saving, production for investment exceeds production for consumption. People are the industry is producing capital goods. The overproduction of commodities is, is denied, but the overproduction of capital is admitted. Okay, going on, overproduction means an overabundance of capital goods relative to consumption goods. Eventually, the capitalist is going to have to sell these goods, though. A capitalist is investing in capital goods, building office towers, building infrastructure, building factories, with the idea that these then will build products and the products will be sold and they'll make money. The problem is that they have to s turn the capital goods into commodity goods so that they can sell those, pay, pay for their purchases of labor. Overproduction, however, hinders the ability of capitalists to transform the values of the commodities into money. If they've overproduced, they can't sell the stuff. There's a glut in the market, so therefore they're, they're not going to be able to get the money they need to pay the workers. A man who has produced does not have the choice of selling or not selling. He must sell. In the crisis arises the very situation in which he cannot sell or can only sell below the cost price and must even sell at a positive loss. The point is that crises exist, and Marx says you can't explain them away by theory. They're there, so we've got to figure out why they're there. The constant recurrence of crisis has in fact reduced the rigmarole of saying others to phraseology, which is now only used in times of prosperity. Um, but it's cast aside in times of crisis. Say's law is false, according to Marx. And the key now is that the crisis comes in times of prosperity. It doesn't, the crisis happens before the crash. It comes during the prosperity time. During prosperous times, excessive capitalist expansion generates the crisis. Marx says, um, crisis are thus reasoned out of existence here by forgetting or denying the first elements of capitalist production. The existence of a product as a commodity, the duplication of the commodity into commodity and money, the consequent separation which takes place in the exchange of commodities, and finally the relation of money and commodities to wage labor. What's going on is it's in the production process you're setting up the system based on exploiting labor that will eventually blow up into a crisis. Economic crises emerge and Capitalism is doomed. Okay. How are we how am I going to explain it in a few minutes? Let's see what we can go through here. The, it's, as I say, economic crises are complex. This stuff is very complex to go through. There's a lot of phases, and let's see if I can walk you through it, talk you through the thing here in a few minutes. It affects the entire structure of the system production, circulation, consumption, trade. Everything is affected in this crisis. So, Marx, in writing about this, is looking at the whole system and how it's changing. So as you can see, you can, that's why his books get so thick. Um, there's two phases of the original crisis. The first phase is what drives the economy to the crisis. That's the artificial boom. The second phase is the crash. The artificial boom, that's my terminology, not his. So you first got this artificial expansion, boom, and then you get a crash. Two stages. 
the unofficial boom is a period of expanding business activity. Business is always thoroughly sound and a campaign in full swing until suddenly the debacle takes place. Production on an expanding scale forms an inherent basis for the phenomenon which appeared during crisis. I think of right before the recent stock market crash. Everything's booming and it goes down. Marxists love crashes. <laughs> expanding capitalist production is inconsistent with production capabilities and consumption demands. What's going on in the boom is that the economy is expanding beyond what it's capable of doing and beyond what anybody really wants to happen. There's an overproduction of capital relative to any demand for capital in the economy. What then does the overproduction of capital mean? Overproduction of value destined to produce surplus value, destined to produce surplus value. If one considers the material content, overproduction of commodities destined for reproduction, that is reproduction on too large a scale, which is the same as overproduction, pure and simple. Capitalists attempt to expropriate more and more surplus value out of production than it is capable of producing. They're trying to squeeze more out of the system than the system can get. There's an attempt to push the economy beyond its frontier, pushing it out past its production possibility frontier. Overproduction, the credit system, etc., are means by which capitalist production seeks to break through its own barriers and to produce over and above its own limits. Capitalist production, on the one hand, has its driving force. On the other hand, it only tolerates production commensurate with the profitable employment of existing capital. Hence, crises arise which simultaneously drive it upward and beyond its own limits and force it to put on seven league boots in order to reach the development of the productive forces which only could be achieved very slowly within its own limits. So it's, the system is pushed away. Okay? How, what pushes this? What drives this? Low interest rates and credit creation. That's what creates it. The banks lend out 500 grand and 100 grand. They create credit. The businesses borrow that credit and they produce stuff that nobody wants. The credit creation. Now, there's the low interest rates and credit. The Austrians that I mentioned are very into the low interest rate issue. Marxism is, we saw interest rates as sort of a meaningless concept. He focuses on the credit creation aspect of, the, of this process. But, it's, but he talks about both. A low rate of interest corresponds to periods of prosperity of extra profit, the mass of circulating media serving the expenditure of revenue growth decidedly in periods of prosperity, i.e. the money supply expands. A period of brisk business is simultaneously a period of the most elastic and easy credit. The banks are lending money like crazy. Think of this country where they're lending money below the inflation rate. Um, the enormous development of the credit system during a prosperity period, hence also the enormous increase in the demand for loan capital and the readiness with which the supply meets it in such periods. Everybody wants to bond the banks? Yeah, sure, we'll lend you lots of money. The system blows. The low rate of interest that accompanies the improvement. In time of flourishing business, before the real speculation gets underway, when credit is easy and confidence is growing. Those are just some quotes taken throughout all these phrases. The entire credit system and the over-trading, over-speculation, etc. connected with it rest on the necessity of expanding and leaping over the barrier to circulation in the sphere of exchange. Credit is going to break money from its labor base, value from its labor base, this artificial credit. In creating credit, the capitalism themselves drive capitalism in the state of crisis. This is what he's got to prove, that capitalism inherently destroys itself. With the development of the credit system, capitalist production continually strives to overcome the metal barrier, which is simultaneously a material and imaginative barrier of wealth and its movement, but again and again it breaks its back on this barrier. It is by no means the strong demands for loans which distinguishes the period of depression from that of prosperity, but the ease with which this demand is satisfied in periods of prosperity and the difficulty which it meets in periods of depression. Prosperity is a period in which it's cheap money. It's out there. Cheap credit, as I say. Um, capital accumulation expands because an easy money market calls such enterprises into being in mass. And what happens now is the structure of production becomes inconsistent with the pattern of consumption. Capitalists throw their money capital necessary to carry on their business in the speculative railway schemes, etc., and make it good by borrowing in the money market, or they invest in third world development or whatever, that type of thing, and the money just grows, disappears in Zaire somewhere. A fall in the rate of interest then leads to the most risky speculative ventures. Returns become wholly deceptive as a result of the loan system. Money's cheap. Everybody's, the thing is, is it blown up. Okay. 
Okay. Fellas, there's the boom. Artificial boom brought about by cheap credit. Now, what brings about the cheap credit? That's another thing. I'll we'll hold off on that, where that comes from. Then we get the crash. Okay, and the second phase is the crash. The crash is when the economy goes, falls apart. A crisis can only be explained, though, as a result of the disproportion of production in various branches of the economy and a result of a disproportion between the consumption of capitalists and the accumulation. You don't explain the crash by the crash. You explain it by what had happened before. To understand the crash, you've got to understand the boom. The boom comes first. And uh, so you've got to know what, why this disproportion, where it's coming from. This crash, in my words here, arrives when loans that must be paid cannot be paid. The industrialists need to pay the day, but they cannot sell until tomorrow. They demand money, but all they have is the supplier is semi-finished commodities. During the break, um, I'm talking to one person who said that the credit system is the expectation of getting future surplus value. You borrow money because then you're going to get value in the future. The problem is, is that you've got to pay your debts now. You haven't sold the product yet, so you're in trouble. You've borrowed all this money to produce product that you haven't finished and got the, the loans that do. The system's uncoordinated. The supply and increased amount of future commodities is what's going on. The production system is now into the future, producing future commodities, if you will, but people still demanding present commodities, so you've got it out of whack. One of the ways you can think of this with respect to workers is that the system now is producing office buildings and factories and machinery and railroads, and it's paying its workers a wage. The workers take that wage and they go out, and what do they want? Milk, beer, corn, rice, meat. But the system's not producing that. The system's producing machinery and equipment. So you've got, but the workers want this, so the system's totally out of whack. It's producing capital goods, but there's a demand for consumption goods. It's, it's distorted. Okay? In this comes inflation, as you can see, because all these workers then get paid a wage and they go out and they try and buy products that aren't there. So the prices are bid up. Okay? Um, to avoid crashing, one way you can avoid, try to avoid crashing is to increase the borrowing. So you owe money, you can't pay it to go to the bank and you borrow more money. You just keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. This is what the United States is doing with Mexico right now in Brazil. They just keep lending these countries more and more money. Um, and they, they keep them from crashing. During such time, Mark says, everyone borrows only for the purpose of paying in order to settle previously contracted obligations. On the other hand, it is clear that as long as the credit of a bank is not shaken, it will alleviate the panic in such cases by increasing credit money and intensify it by contracting it later. So what he argues is that the banks will keep lending money out as long as they can get away with it. Now, how do they get away with it in the United States? This would be the Austrian argument is our banks are backed by the central government and the taxpayers bail out the banks eventually. Marx doesn't have that in his model. Um, the once the problem, though, is if you keep delaying it, once the crash comes, it's even more severe, because he says permanent crises do not exist. You can't prevent the crash. It has to come. The rate of interest reaches its peak. In times of crisis, the demand for loan capital, and therefore the rate of interest reaches its maximum. The rate of profit has, for all intents and purposes, disappeared. The split between surplus value in between profit and interest, interest goes to 100%, profit goes to zero. The industrials get nothing, the bankers get it all. It's a crash. Once the expansion of credit halts, the crash is intimate. Hence, what appears as a crisis in the money market is in reality an expression of the abnormal conditions in the very process of production and reproduction. Importantly, the crisis is a real sector phenomena that is expressed in the financial sector, but it has to do with the fact that the real sector is out of whack. The production is totally out of, out of control, out of, distort, out of control, it's totally distorted. You see it in the financial sector. You see the stock exchange dropping. The reason it's dropping is the underlying production, production process is distorted. It's a real sector crisis. The only way you can resolve it is a crash. The crash has to come. Or you have a crack-up boom, but if you have a crack-up boom, then this place blows up. Marx doesn't allow for the crack-up boom. He doesn't talk about capitalism expanding to the point that it, it blows up and then the workers take this over. He has a model that it if you will, there's a crisis, and a bigger crisis, and a bigger crisis, and a bigger crisis, and eventually the workers say, we're sick of this, we're taking this thing over, we're going to run it ourselves for a change. These capitalists don't know how to run a business. And then it's, but it's recurring crises that are eventually going to teed off. Hence the phenomenon that crisis did not come to the surface, did not break out in the retail business first, which deals with the direct consumption, but in the spheres of wholesale trade and banking, which places the money capital of society at the disposal of the former, the crisis occurs when the returns of merchants to sell in distant markets become so slow and meager 
that the bank's press for payment or promissory notes for purchased commodities become due before the latter have been resold. Then forced sales take place, sales in order to meet payments. Then comes the crash, which brings the illusory <coughs> prosperity to an abrupt end. What kind of interference was there in the, in the banking system in Boston? There's some interference. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit next week. I'll bring you in some on it. He does study the development of the Bank of England. And what you end up having is the Bank of England starts backing this whole thing. So Marx sees the Bank of England licensed by the central by the government as a way in which the banks try and legitimize this whole system of credit expansion and get the state to back it. Um, because what happens with central banking is you can divorce it from gold. If you've got a gold-based money system, it's very hard to do this. Everything's based on gold, so we've got to divorce from gold so the bankers can expand lots of credit. And, that, and to do that, that, that has to be backed by something. So the government comes in and creates, and says this is legal tender, the pound's legal tender, you've got to deal with it. The dollar's legal tender, the rand's legal tender. So they, you'll see the banking, that, that's part of state capitalism. He's already analyzing it right back then. It's a real, you know, right at the beginning of this whole thing of central banking. Yeah. Yeah, the United States doesn't have a central bank until 1913. It developed quite well without one. That's a whole other story, but I think we could do a lot better without central banks and with them. Marx sees the central banks as part of an attempt to catalyze and monopolize banking power. Um, okay. Those who say there is merely a means of lack of payment are fools who believe that it is the duty and the power of banks to transform all bankrupt swindlers into solvent and respectable capitalists by means of pieces of paper. <laughs> Those who say that there is merely a lack of capital are just quibbling about words. It's precisely at such time there is a mass of inconvertible capital as a result of over-imports and over-production. The problem is over-production, not too little capital, too much. The entire system of forced expansion of the reproduction process cannot, of course, be remedied by having some bank, like the Bank of England, give to all the swindlers the deficient capital by means of its paper. But he does analyze that. He will analyze the, the bank system. But he says it's not going to work. What he's, what he's essentially saying there is that the state cannot manage the money supply efficiently to maintain economic stability. Is he advocating that idea? He's advocating abolishment of capitalism. Yo, yo, he doesn't know. He, he doesn't see that the central bank will, um, will be able to prevent economic crises. He's, he doesn't see that it won't work. It just can't do it. Maybe he doesn't want money at all. Eventually, he doesn't want money per se. I mean, suppose if he's got a distinguishing between good ways and bad ways in yeah. the money system, money per se is the problem. But he's this, he would say, um, a modern Marxist would say that the attempt to manage the money supply by the Reserve Bank is just an attempt to save an inherently unstable system and it can't work. And so I would argue on this, and what I ended up my dissertation on this was, if we abolish the Reserve Bank, we can have a test. And if, and if the system blows up, then Marx is right. If it doesn't blow up, then the libertarians and free marketeers are right. Well, either way, we'll get on with where we should be, that the bank is central bank is sort of delaying the economy, either getting wealthy and rich or blowing up and getting us onto the communist system. Central bank is sort of slowing down evolution. That's my, my argument. So my my um, dissertation advisors said they hoped that the model wasn't tested. <laughs> I still think it should be. I'd like to see, see if we could live again without re central banks. But the United States had its greatest period of economic growth without a central bank. Didn't need it. It was in the nineteenth century. Okay, the, the industrialists have got to sell. This is another problem. The industrialists are broke. They can't sell their products. The forced sales play a very significant role. The crisis occurs not only because the commodity is unsalable, because it is not salable within a particular period of time. And the crisis arises and derives its character not only from the unsalability of the commodity, but from the non fulfillment of a whole series of payments which depend on the sale of this particular commodity within this particular period of time. They can't get the, they can't get the product sold, they can't get the money, they can't pay the workers, they can't pay the suppliers, the, you know, they're in trouble. His picture is very clear, I think. If you read this, I'll read this one longer one because I think it's, it's interesting to see how clear of a picture he has of economic crisis. As soon as the stoppage takes place as a result of delayed returns, glutted markets of fallen prices, a superabundance of industrial capital becomes available, but in a form which it cannot perform its functions. 
you can think of the Great Depression. All the machinery there, all the workers out of work, it's there, but it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. The capital isn't exploiting the labor. The workers aren't working, they're out of work. You've got to get them back in the work to exploit them. Huge quantities of commodity capital, but unsalable. Huge quantities of fixed capital, though, but largely idle due to stagnant reproduction during the crisis itself. Since everyone has products to sell, cannot sell them, and yet must sell them in order to meet payments, it is not the mass of idle and investment-seeking capital, but rather the mass of capital impeded in the production process that is greatest just when the shortage of credit is most acute. The capital already invested is then indeed idle in large quantities because the reproduction process is stagnant. Factories are closed, raw materials accumulate, finished products flood the market as commodities. It's pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, that's answer, I think. Yeah. Peter Harrison shows that the speculation in land, the increase in land prices, brings about this combustion of Land is part of it. If you've got an expansion of credit, that credit's going to go in and buy things. And one of the things it's going to buy is land. Mm -hmm. See, so it's not available where it's needed for the production. Of right. It's gone into uh, over speculation in land. Land's, I haven't done land, uh, land speculation, but that does play a part in this. And if you look in the 1920s in the United States, a big part of the credit expansion in the 20s went into land speculation in states like Florida. And then in the 30s, there was the crash. Is a very good example where you have growth, speculation, crash, yeah. growth, speculation, crash. Yeah. Five times the thing I think was about 60 years. And machine guns all the way through here in Chicago. Yeah. Well, that's kind of right. That keeps the thing, keeps the thing going. Um, no, it is. Chicago did. Yeah, Chicago is very much a riffering city in the, early, in the early days, in the 1850s and 60s. Um, the sudden change of the credit system into a monetary system. What happens in the crash is everybody goes back to hard cash. Everybody says, we don't want credit, we want money. So you get this reemergence of the money system. The sole form of wealth for which people clamor at such times is money, hard crash. There's a flight to real values. In times of squeeze, when credit contracts or seizes entirely, money suddenly stands as the only means of payment and true existence of value in absolute opposition to all the commodities. What's money? Money is gold. Gold back in. Gold. That's in terms of gold. Gold. This actual actuality occurs in certain periods of crisis, namely when credit collapses completely and when not only commodities and securities are unsalable, but bills of exchange are not discountable and nothing counts any more for money payment or as the merchant puts it, cash. In the crisis, the demand is made that all bills of exchange, securities, and commodities shall be simultaneously convertible into bank money and all this bank money in turn into gold. Everybody goes right back to labor and body value, gold. The, and I'll mention a little bit next week how he goes from gold money to paper money to credit money, how the state has a role in that. But what we're seeing here is you've got all this credit out there and everybody crashes and goes back into gold, which means that crashes should be good for South Africa, but it hasn't happened this one. Mm -hmm. Gold has been oddly not, it's not rising like I would expect it to. I struggle there. I do make gold. Yeah, okay, this is, that might be part of it, yeah, the selling that's going on. Um, he does talk about then there's not enough of the precious metal to satisfy the demands. So we can skip through that. The, um, the irony of the crash is that credit is needed, but it cannot prevent the crash. They need credit, they've got to pay off, but if you give more credit, then it just gets worse and worse. You can't, you, eventually you've got to have it. Um, a certain quantity of metal, insignificant compared with the total production, is admitted to be the pivotal point of the system. Hence, the superb theoretical dualism, aside from the appalling manifestation of this characteristic that it possesses as the pivotal point during crisis, gold and silver become capital par excellence, for whose preservation every other form of capital and labor is to be sacrificed. Everybody goes to gold, the heck with people, the heck with machinery and equipment. Everybody goes clamoring for, for gold. Prices fall. There's overproduction turns into a loss of human uh, resources. You know, this real human tragedy here. The price deflation is what bankrupts the industrial entrepreneurs. They can't sell their products. Real capital is destroyed. The reproduction process is checked. The labor process is restricted. Mass unemployment happens. There's underconsumption now because the workers can't get any food. There's little consumption, but un underconsumption comes from overproduction. And finally, I point out that the crash then is the first phase of the recovery. The crash then sets up the new one. The crisis manifests the unity of two phases that become independent of each other. The crash brings things back together. 
in a very uncomfortable way. From the time to time, the conflict of antagonistic agencies find vent in crises. The crises are always but momentary and forcible solutions of the existing contradictions. They are violent eruptions which for a time restore the disturbed equilibrium. Can you bear with me a few more minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Running late. Getting excited. Really made for this Marxist theory that the capitalism precedes the communism. Mm. Yeah, that's the part of what they'll see is that you've got an export, exploitation of capital, and capital, this is the imperialist theory, and capital is lent all over the world and then messes up the rest of the world, and then you have crises in those places, and eventually and you move to revolutions. See, he's, this is going to be the basis for his revolution, is his system. The system of instability. He's arguing that revolution comes from economic instability, not political activism. Political activism follows on an economic basis. And so they will look at that. They'll look at this massive credit expansion that. Uh, let's give up money. Pardon? Let's forget about money. Let's become, uh, take, up, take on Marxism. That's the third world countries. Yeah. Uh, what are, they, are they ever going to pay it? Can yeah. they pay it? Yeah. So what's going to happen in the long run? There's, there's going to be some crashes, yeah. In some areas, there'll be a crash. Or they'll be bailed out by money in the other countries. One of the problems is... Yeah. One of the problems is when you get into the third world, though, is Marx is talking about this in the developed economy. And what we're seeing in the third world is an attempt to develop economy, so they aren't quite there yet. They're in the early stages of capitalism. The problem is, is that the developed economies have taken a lot of their wealth and thrown it into steel mills in Mexico that don't work and things like that, you know? And, uh, with well, it produces growth that is producing products that nobody wants. Now, I mean, it, it produces growth within people. They see well, what they did wrong, and they, and they grow as a result. Uh -huh. they, they don't here because they, 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 if you, I would agree with you in a market analysis of say we'd learn from our mistakes, we'd figure out what to do, and we'd get on and do it better. What a Marxist would say is no, what happens is that this gets worse and worse and worse. You've got a capitalist class that is eternally greedy that just wants more and more money. They're just m mad for power, and they just keep pushing the system. Isn't it an adjustment, a breakdown of crisis? Yeah, but each one gets worse and worse and worse. The Why crisis of... Huh? Because the capital concentrates. Capital concentrates in power. That's what we'll get... That's the next section. That's not actually true. I would catch But this is what he says happens. I'm not saying it's true. You know, the, the empirical evidence questions the model, so, especially the aspect of the recurring crisis. The Austrians would say that the reason you get a recurring crisis has to do with <coughs> credit expansion by the central bank. The Marxists are going to have to say it has to do with internal credit expansion, that the capitalists never learn their mistakes and they keep doing the same mistakes over in a worse and worse stage. That's their argument. Um, if the capitalist order is to coordinate itself, it has to go through crash, crash and depression. Depression is a period of adjustment. It's got to do it. Yeah. When the production process is curtailed, when the prices of commodities are at the lowest level, when the spirit of enterprise is paralyzed, the rate of interest is low, which in this case indicates nothing more than an increase in loanable capital, precisely <coughs> as a result of contraction and paralyzation of industrial capital. There's your depression. It's not comfortable. Factories are closed. People out of work. You know, it's all the pictures of a depression. The sad thing about it is that in the boom, people work. They produce commodities, now they do not receive the fruits of their labor. And as Marx says, an even stranger aspect of all the overproduction is that the workers, the actual producers of the very commodities which glut the market, are in need of these commodities. It cannot be said here that they should produce things in order to obtain them, for they have produced them and yet have not got them. It's a good line. You know, it's a system that people, people did all the work as fruit, is what he's saying. Okay. Workers have supplied investment goods while their need or demand is for consumption goods. Steel, cement, machinery cannot feed a family. In the Depression, workers, and this is me writing, in the Depression, workers are in great need of employment and there are no jobs. There is mass unemployment of labor, raw <coughs> materials, and capital. The production process has collapsed because it has not been supply and demand. There is general underconsumption. The necessary adjustment is a slow and painful process. Okay. What happens is that the industrialists clamor for real money to pay their bills, so they have to sell their capital for virtually nothing. Who buys it? The bankers. The bankers pick up this capital cheap. 
Capital becomes concentrated in the hands of the bankers. It is at such times that the money capitalist buy this depreciated paper in huge quantities, which in the later phases soon regains its former level and rises above it. So his notion is that in the crash, you have a concentration of wealth. The industrialists go broke, the bankers pick up Anglo, that type of stuff. You know, so they pick it up cheap. So to go and see if the bankers are trading right now in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. That would be a, a question. What are they doing with the money? Are they buying up this capital? Waiting for it to drop further. Maybe waiting for it to drop further, yeah. Oh, you don't mean bankers. I mean, anyone who's got the money. The money capitalists, yeah. But he sees them as a, as a concentrating group, the, the money lenders, the money capitalists. And, um, okay. Recurring crashes allow an even smaller capitalist class to dominate and impoverish and have a larger proletariat. The rich get poor, the poor get rich get richer, the poor get poorer. The industrialists are thrown into the proletariat class. They're bankrupt. They're out. They become part of the working class, and a smaller group of money capitalists and bankers get richer and richer. The conditions take shape for the socialist revolution. Now you've got is that you've got a larger and larger class of oppressed people, exploited people. Prices aren't random, they happen over and over again. The concentration of capital is a technical basis for the new artificial boom. A crisis always forms a starting point of large new investments, therefore from the point of view of society as a whole, more or less a new material basis for the next turnover cycle. This he's a little thinner on, but he's going to argue that you concentrate capital and they start, they do it again. And then they get into it and they start expanding, they blow up the system again and then they do it again. Um, it's the underlying social relations that bring about this recurring business cycle. The capitalists strive to exploit as, expropriate as much surplus value as they possibly can from production. What drives it to happen again is its desire to exploit workers and get surplus value. It's that relationship that pushes the cycle on. The ultimate desire of the capitalists to enrich themselves and to enlarge their capital. The laborers are exploited. Um, okay. Last little point I should really put this as a subheading is there's an underconsumption component. The ultimate reason for our crises always remains a poverty and restricted consumption of the masses as opposed to the drive of the capitalist production to develop the productive forces as though only the absolute consuming power of society constituted their limit. He says at one time that it's overproduction and at the other time that really what it's all about to get down down to it is the fact that the workers are being exploited. There's underconsumption, the workers are not getting to keep their product, their value. The problem with that is, is that some people now interpret this as the way to go to business cycles is to redistribute wealth. And you get sort of neo-Marxists that are into what welfare capitalism redistribution programs is the way to give po purchasing power to the workers or to the masses, and therefore we won't have instability. A variant of this you see with the Social Democratic Party in Germany, which has developed out of Marx's old parties and now is sort of a mucky left wing party, not real strong Marxist, and they're into the wealth redistribution. You see it with Sweden and so on. Marx wouldn't buy this. He wouldn't buy this notion that if we get rid of the underconsumption problem, we're going to get rid of crisis. Crisis are going to happen even in welfare capitalism. The problem is overproduction, not underconsumption. Underconsumption is the, the sadness of it, if you will. The workers are exploited, but what drives it is the overproduction. So it's not even giving the workers the capital that they need? No. You can, it's no good giving workers share ownership. They won't solve the problem because the system is still unstable. It just alters the cycles. Yeah, it just will come back again. And, um, the contradiction to put in a general way consists in that the capitalist mode of production involves a tendency to its absolute development of the productive forces regardless of the value and surplus value it contains. In other words, regardless of the amount paid to wages and the profits, value and surplus value, and regardless of the social conditions on which the capitalist production takes place, regardless who owns the shares. While on the other hand, its aim is to preserve the value of the existing capital and promote its self-expansion to the highest limit. It's, capitalism is driven to overproduce itself, irrespective of who owns the capital. Capitalist production seeks to overcome these imminent barriers by overcoming them only by means which again place these barriers in its way and on a more formal scale. The real barrier of capitalist production is capital itself. So the way to get rid of economic crisis is to get rid of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And the workers are going to do that in the revolution, of course. One of the things that he doesn't do in the last section here on bankers is really short. He doesn't clearly connect up the social relation issue of exploiting the worker with 
the whole credit creation process. It's there, but it isn't tight. He doesn't quite fit this all together. Um, he sees it. He just can't, to me, he doesn't tie it together. In capitalist society, great disturbances may and must occur. On one hand, pressure is brought about to bear on the money market. On the other hand, an easy money market calls for such enterprises into being in mass, thus creating the very circumstances which later give rise to pressure on the money market. Pressure is brought to bear on the money market since large advances of money capital are constantly needed for long periods of time. The problem is, is I don't know, he doesn't explain clearly where that pressure comes from. And that's, I put in the question, is the demand for credit sufficient to create its own supply? In other words, if people want credit, will the account bankers necessarily create it? He's saying yes. I question whether they will. If bankers get smart, they say, no, we're not going to lend this stuff out of it because it's going to mess everything up. But he says that they'll naturally do it. That's exactly the position of the book. Well, maybe we do. If, if you follow Marx, I, I wonder if we do. You follow the third, the third world debt crisis and the one in America. Yeah. But the one in America and the one in the third world is not a pure capital <coughs> system. You've got a state involved with it. Mm -hmm. So you get this problem of is it is the reason we have credit expansion because we have a, this monopoly banking system run by the reserve. Tying in the, big, the, the nine big banks in America and what's happening there. Yeah. yeah. Well, the nine big banks have, uh, use the, the Federal Reserve System. Oh, well, they're using it. Yeah. And so the question is is, is, is the problem a problem of banking and capitalism per se, or is it a problem that we have this intervention in banking brought about by the state? And that's the question. That's the real question. And will the banking system, if we got rid of this, this legalized cartel, would the banking system stabilize itself? Mark says no. I tend to say yes. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's a tough experiment to, to, to go into. Um, money demand in turn determines money supply, according to Marx. And there's a whole big theory on hoarding and dishoarding and and if, if there's a demand for money, the money will be supplied, and I'm, I'm not even giving you any of that. There's a huge model on that, where it gets into. It's the opposite of saying. Yeah, right, then. The, right the demand creates its own supply, is what you're saying. The demand for credit creates a supply of credit, so therefore the system's unstable. Credit just is created when there's demand, so therefore people borrow, 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 overproduce, overproduce, and everything is uncontrollable. The system's chaotic. In fact, just the fact that there is this massive capital that makes it unstable. Yeah, but it's, and also the ability to, to mass capital beyond real capital with credit. Beyond? Beyond real capital, produced capital. capital. Oh, yes. That extra 400 rand, I put 100 rand in the bank and the bank runs off 500 rand. The question I ask is what induces the bankers to expand the supply of money capital? Is it because cheap credit is demanded by the industrialists? And I say this can't be so. Otherwise, credit would not contract in times of the crisis. If credit demand determined its supply, the economy would never crash. It would just, it would explode, literally. It would go beyond. Why do the banks then contract it if demand is driving supply? And I'm, I'm not clear what he's trying to do here. And I say he doesn't clearly explain the automatic process of credit expansion and contraction. How does this work? Perhaps, some people argue, perhaps bankers expand credit knowing full well that it will bring about crises, and then in bringing it about, they expand it intentionally, so therefore they can take over the system. So you've got this idea that the bankers know this, they expand credit, so then they can they can blow the system up and pick it up for 10 cents in the dollar or whatever. They can buy it cheaply. And this is the conspiracy theorist. You get these people that the Rockefellers are controlling the world and all this. Conspir be a cartel of banks. It couldn't be no, no, it's a cartel. It's the nine banks that you just referred to. Um, then this conspiracy theorist, this left-wing conspiracy theorist, right-wing conspiracy theorist, talk about the entire world is managed by the banking class. And I say, however, they, to suggest that bankers are opportunists is one thing. To suggest that they are in control of the world economy is another. It's vulgar Marxism. Marxism doesn't have a activist banking class. They do it because they're driven to it, not because they're conspiring. It isn't that they, they're planning this thing out. Marx posits that the interactions of capital and labor result from underlying social relations. They do not result from the conscious decision-making of the ruling capitalist class. Crises are the unintended consequences of the capitalist mode of production. They are not the intended consequences of the bankers. And so the, this crisis is inherent. It is not something that is caused by the bankers. It's just something that is inherent per se. That's what he's contending. I disagree with you. It is caused by them, but it's not, uh, it, it's not controlled. No, uh, it's caused by them in a sense, but what's caused is this underlying exploitation of labor is what causes the whole system to be perverse. Opportunism. Yeah, it's, it's, it's opportunism with it going for profit. Profit seeking mm. is what causes it, but it isn't caused in the sense of this, this 
sort of conspiracy of bankers in Manhattan and, and the city in London that sort of sit down and control the world, James Bond style. Yeah, I think but, you know? Uh, but some people like to say that. They, they see it that, and I don't buy that. I, but I don't understand still fully why the system is driven to this, but according to Marx, it is. And I'll just end with the last ones. Credit is the medium of economic crisis. This is a summary here. Credit's the medium. The expansion of credit and the corresponding reduction of interest bring on the artificial boom. In the boom, the structure of production expands in a manner inconsistent with consumption. A crash is inevitable. Prices occur because of contradictory social relations, because you're still driving to exploit labor. So they come again and again, they recur. And I ask, are capitalist crises an inherent feature of the market economy? Is capitalism doomed? Marx believes so. He says it's inherently economically doomed. Marx economics, sir. Next week, we're on the revolution of politics. There's one book here, a couple things. I, there was another announcement, too, before we go. There's one book here called The Meaning of Marx that's been brought to my attention, which draws his ideas from his early love poetry, so you might be interested in that. <laughs> uh, another one, too, is uh, in the back, Gal Day asked me if I'd announce that Gal Day, could you stand up so some people may know who you are? Gal's involved with running, um, this is an advertisement now, she's involved with running something called Solution Parties, which is promoting a decentralized political system for South Africa. And if you're interested in running a party to hear about decentralized political systems, talk to Gal and she'd be happy to come over and party with you all night. I wore my um, Cuban shirt tonight since we were talking about revolutions. Because I had to get in the spirit. This is a guy of bear shirt. It was developed invented in a band of Cuba. It's very popular shirt in the Caribbean. So that's why I'm looking sort of resorty tonight. Uh, what I thought we could do today is to start off and have me spend a few minutes reviewing what I talked about in the last three sections, because I've thrown a lot of material at you, so maybe just uh, spend a few minutes just saying what were, I, I thought were key points in, in the, the last sections and then move on to politics. Hopefully tonight's won't be as intense as last Wednesday's. That was a fairly intense session. It should be a little, little less uh, rigorous, I hope might be a little more depressing, though, so that, there's a trade-off there somewhere. Okay, the first week that we did, we, I called it biography, or you could call it history. I wanted to get across who this man was and the effects of him in the first week. So the first section, 1818 to 1883, the key point was to show that Marx was a true intellectual, that he's influenced by a lot of European cultures, European ideas. He combines German philosophy, French political science, and British economics together to build this model. So, he, And he's a real person. He has a wife. He has a mistress. He has illegitimate children. He has a maid. You know, he's, a, he's a regular guy that way. He, he's not, not a worker. He doesn't work. He, he's a maid. Hmm? He's a maid. All the, his whole life. And he got a pregnant and an illegitimate child that Engels raised as his, and um, who later committed suicide in France. His, two of his kids committed suicide. Um, his writings, he was incredible, incredibly pro prolific. He wrote volumes of information 100 years before they invented the word processor. This little handouts I have, I, don't, I, I, I can't even keep up with how much this guy wrote when he wrote. He's incredible. And I'm just trying to do, do sections of what he wrote. He wrote on history, philosophy, economics, politics. He wrote on loads of subjects. He was across the board. Um, and that's why you see him influ his influence in so many different disciplines and universities, because he wrote about education, he wrote about philosophy, he wrote about um, history and so on. And so he's picked up in all these disciplines. And finally, the legacy, the third part of that first session, I was trying to get across the idea that self-proclaimed Marxist states are less than ideal. Self-proclaimed Marxist states have some shortcomings. They don't seem to be doing what Marx is looking for. And lose my crowd here. There's a couple seats up here, James. That's okay. Gives me an excuse to take a break, by the way. Um, so, 
the third section of this is to explain that countries that call themselves Marxists seem to have some problems. They've got some problems with respect to um, their development. They have problems with respect to concerns that Marx has on alienation, exploitation. They still have those. My, my special concern with them is that there's a lack of individual and collective freedom in these countries. Not only don't they have individual freedom, they also don't have a collective freedom. There's no <laughs> democracy, there's no free expressions. Gorbachev's trying, starting to make some moves to change things, but it's going to be a long way. And another real concern I have is that a lot of the Marxist states have allowed legitimated mass slaughters of people. Millions and millions of people have died in the name of Marxism. From the Soviet Union, China, Pol Pot and Cambodia is the worst example. And the question I'll get is, are these, I, I ask myself, and I still can't answer it, are these regimes that call themselves Marxists consistent with what Marx had in mind? Are they consistent with what Marx is advocating? In some ways I say yes, in some ways I say no. When it comes to the violence, I think I'll make the case today that there's, there's a definite yes. Marx was an advocate of violence. And the violence that we see in those <coughs> cultures, I think, is um, influenced by Marx's theory of politics. It's a political violence theory. Okay, the second week on philosophy, there were key points. A key point was alienation, and I think alienation is his underlying view of market relations, that exchange, money, prices, wages, everything in the markets have this alienating alienated essence to them, that people are somehow estranged, they're separated, they're not working as a community. And I see that as key to understanding Marx's sort of view or uh, assessment of capitalism as a system. And the second point is this sort of philosophical method, which is called historical materialism. And there's two aspects of that. One is that society is determined by material forces. We'll see that again today when we talk about the political system building on the economic system that the underlying means of mode of production determines social structures, social systems, including the family, including the state, religions, and so on. And another aspect of that is a, is a notion of an evolutionary process, that society is moving, that humankind is moving through various social <coughs> epochs, and that one builds on the other, builds on the other, until we get this final epoch called socialism. So there's this evolution up to some sort of end state, and then that end state will be whatever, nirvana or heaven on earth. And that's another aspect of historical materialism. And then the third part in philosophy is labor theory of value. And the key here is that Marx sees that value comes from work, not from utility. Things don't have value because we get satisfaction out of them. Things have value because somebody produced them. Value is supply side, work side. Um, and even though a lot of modern-day Marxists have, have abandoned the labor theory of value and technical economic analysis. It's still a key part of Marx's feeling about what is of worth in society. What is of worth is production by people, not consumption by people, if you will. It's, it's the producing that counts. Okay. Um, the third last week on economics, which is quite intensive, we looked at first exploitation, which is, if you will, the transformation of uh, how would you say, the materialization of alienation in the workplace, that workers are exploited in the production process. Workers work eight hours a day, but they only need to work two hours a day to live, so six hours of their effort is taken from them in the form of what Marx calls surplus value, that which the worker produces and doesn't keep. And Marx views that as exploitation. It's a technical concept, exploitation, and it's the one in which he concept in which he bases his model of how capitalism works. It's a system of, if you will, theft from the workers. The workers produce value and the capitalists steal it from them. The um, next part in capitalist accumulation was ex essentially trying to explain that capitalists are driven to accumulate. They're driven to make profits. They're driven to get surplus value, or another way to say it, they're driven to exploit workers. And in so doing, they set the stage for a, an unstable um, an unstable economic system. Part of what was in there is that in the quest for capital, you get a struggle between the bankers and the industrialists. And Marx says the money capitalists and the industrial capitalists. And this the struggle over surplus value in the capitalist class between the lenders and the borrowers, whatever you want to call the two groups. And that came out there. Well, this all sets the stage for the last section I talked about, which is his overproduction crises. 
And in the over in that arc, that section I tried to show Marx's theory of why capitalism is unstable, why it inherently falls apart, and why revolution is inevitable. It basically hinges, as I read Marx, on artificial credit creation, that it's the expansion of credit by banks that is not backed by real value, that is, if you will, money created out of thin air that's <coughs> not backed by gold, that causes cap allows for capitalists to overproduce commodities, specifically to overproduce capital, which pushes the economy beyond its limits, and it, and it, and it causes an artificial expansion where the businesses are overproducing, over-investing, and eventually there's a crash to adjust for that. <coughs> a crash because the businesses are producing products that they can't make a profit off of, that they can't realize value in. Okay, the crisis then occurs when businesses start going bankrupt. As they start going bankrupt, the bankers pick up the pieces, so the bankers take over the capital from the industrialists. And, and you get a further centralization of capital, but they keep pushing more profit, so they do it again. And then each time, according to Marx, it's going to get worse and worse and worse until finally the workers get mad as hell and say, we're sick of this, and they take over the system. They throw the bums out. That's his, his notion of crises. He's doing that to try and explain that the revolution will come from economic factors, not from political factors, because his whole philosophy is one that the economics determines everything. So revolution is got to be a subset of economic instability. That's what he tr he's trying to argue there in that overproduction crisis model. Now, that's incredibly complicated stuff. I gave you parts of it. He goes on for volumes dealing with this. But I think the one that gives him his best light is this notion of credit creation. That one makes has some sense to it. Some of his other crisis models are a little weaker. But this is the one that I think, if you're going to try and give Marx is due as, as a macroeconomic theorist, you've got to focus on that model. So that's what I gave you. OK. Um, I will, yeah. Oh, you need some more of these. OK. What I'm going to do today, then, is talk about politics. And next week, we're going to I'll talk about fantasy. Fantasy is going to be my sort of interpretation of a socialist dream. <coughs> what, what he what he means by that. Um, next week, we'll on the work on the section working class consciousness. What to say? What does Marx mean by this? Is there such a thing as a collective conscious? What is this all about? Dictatorship of the proletariat. I'll talk about his two stages of communism. First, the transition from capitalism to communism, and second, communism itself. What this is, how he views it, and why it's. I think it's this pie in the sky. It's ridiculous. And then I'll drive that home with the third section I called socialism, which will basically be a review of something known today as the, um, the socialist calculation debate, so the impossibility of economic calculation and the socialism. And this is a long history of literature that comes out after the Bolshevik Revolution arguing that socialism cannot work. It, it cannot economically work, and we'll go through that as sort of to drive the nail in the coffin and say that this is a nice theory, but it's not doesn't do the job. And so that'll be next week's next week's sort of argument is basically one of critique. Um, if you've got questions, or if you think I've left things out to, uh, tonight, ask me because I've got one more talk I can give you. And I, if I haven't covered and you'd like to have have it covered, talk to me in the break, and I'll see if I can fit it in next week. So. This isn't everything Marx said, but it's, it's, it's fairly comprehensive. But it doesn't, if there's something you'd like to push, for example, today I didn't do a section on strikes. I just couldn't find the material I wanted. Um, next time I do it, I want to make sure there's a subsection on strikes, because it's an important area, especially with the development of strikes as a means of negotiation in this country. So if I do find some stuff that I feel comfortable with using, I may mention strikes as a tangential topic next time. OK. Uh, this time we're going to do state capitalism, and by that I'm, I'm going to talk about how the state is part of the capitalist system in Marx, and then labor movements, how labor becomes associated and collectivized to form the basis for revolution, and then his view of revolution. And in revolution, I'm going to emphasize mostly what I think is important to see is his advocacy of violence and destruction as a means for political reform and a means for social progress. You progress through destruction, not through coordination. 
I put a little joke down there that I ran across when I was going through this. I'll read through. This is just a little side one just to lighten things up a little bit. Social definitions of different systems. Socialism, you have two cows, the government gives one to your neighbor. Communism, you have two cows, the government takes them and gives you milk. Fascism, you have two cows, the government takes them and sells you milk. Nazism, you have two cows, the government takes them and shoots you. Capitalism, you have two cows, you sell one and buy a bull. That's a nice way of summarizing different economic systems. I, I, there was something I cut out years ago, so that was a little freebie. Okay, questions, anybody? On to politics. State capitalism. There's four, uh, four points I go through. First, the economic basis of the state. Second, democracy. Third, private property. And fourth is the case. Money in the state is a case study of the interplay between capitalism and the state in the, in the provision of money, central banking, and so on. Okay. Basically, the economic basis is that capital, it's capitalism that controls the state, not the state that controls capitalism, <coughs> Marx. The state is a puppet of the capitalist system. He says, the sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which rises a legal and political superstructure. Law and politics sit on top of economics. Economics is the base. The material life of individuals, their more mode, it should be mode of production, excuse me, their mode of production and form of intercourse, which mutually determine each other. This is the real basis of the state and remains so at all the stages at which division of labor and private property is still necessary. These actual relations are in no way created by the state power. On the contrary, they are the power creating it. It's the capitalist relations that create the state, not vice versa. Power lies with capital, not with the state. To speak of government intervention in a market economy is misleading to a Marxist, if not just nonsensical. The government intervenes at the bidding of the capitalist class. So when you talk to a Marxist and, they, and you're saying, well, I don't like government intervention, and I don't like what Pretoria is doing, controlling the stock market or whatever, they'll say, well, that's, Pretoria is part of the stock market. It's, they're all part of the same insidious bunch of capitalist pigs that are controlling the country. And so it's very hard to talk to somebody that takes this view, if you take the view that there's sort of a market versus government world, and they take the view that the government's part of the market, you could end up talking right past each other. And it's basic to Marx's view of, of economics. Okay, and democracy, democratic capitalism is still capitalism. He likes democracy, but he doesn't like capitalism, so he doesn't see democratic capitalism as any great thing. Liberation requires the end of capitalism. It doesn't matter whether it's a dictatorial capitalism or democratic capitalism. And his argument then is that political struggles are essentially economic struggles, that if we're calling for political liberation, we're really essentially calling for economic liberation. All struggles within the state, the struggle between democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy, the struggle for the franchise, etc., etc., are merely the illusory forms in which the real struggles of the different classes are fought out among one another. What he means there by real struggles are the economic struggles. Okay. Marx does favor democracy. He, is a, he's, uh, he does advocate it but he, as a good system, but he doesn't see it as the direct means for liberation. He's not keen on democracy as a, as a road to, to, to socialism, if you will. He's very, and he's very concerned that democratic reform will attempt to make the current system workable, and he doesn't like that. So it, he spends a lot of time critiquing, how would you say, soft socialists who want to do reform measures. He's very upset with them, and I have one quote from that, talking about that. From, far from desiring to revolutionize our society, the democratic petty bourgeois, and he was referring to a German group here, the democratic petty bourgeois strive for a change in social conditions by means of which existing society will be made as tolerable and as comfortable as possible. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like democratic reform. That's not the way to go. In that view then, too, from a, from a Marxist viewpoint, a Marxist viewpoint, modern welfare capitalism is still <laughs> capitalism. It's not socialism. So Sweden is a capitalist system in which democracy has made it more tolerable to the workers, but it's still a capitalist system. It still has private ownership, still has exchange, still has money, um, still has trade, and so on. And so the economic model is still there, even though there's a lot of redistribution on top of it. And Marxists will say, well, that's a way to buy out the workers or something so that they don't revolt. Um, 
Okay. The key then is dem democracy may or may not be necessary for revolution. Sometimes he talks about its, its possibility. We'll see that later. But it's the underlying relations, material relations, that need to be changed, not the democratic system. It's the economic system that has to be attacked. You need to look at his model, what he's looking at to understand what he's thinking. Yeah, yeah. It comes out of his, econo his view of the world that it's, you know, you're not going to solve things by having democratic reform. You're going to solve things by changing economic systems. Um, okay, though he, he's not, he's not anti-demo, he's not, a dic he doesn't favor dictatorship. It, that's, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a democracy in Marxist terms. It's not a one-man dictatorship. Okay, when you start looking at the state, another aspect of the state and capitalism is private property. Marx sees in private property just the same stuff he sees in all the other institutions of capitalism. It's alienation. But private property becomes important here because the state maintains private property. Marx says, private property is only the sensuous expression of the fact that man becomes a hostile and inhuman object to himself, that the expression of his life entails its externalization, its realization becomes a loss of reality and alien reality. It's a very different view of private property than a free market person has, this idea that it makes us inhuman and all this. Private property has made us so stupid and narrow-minded that an object is ours only when we have it, when it exists as capital for us, or when we directly possess, eat, drink, wear, inhabit it, etc., in short, when we use it. That sounds like a good definition to me of private property, but Marx doesn't like it. That's not his, he th thinks it's lousy because it's something we only have it if we have it. He says he wants it to be more of a collective concept of having as opposed to an individualistic Capitalism cannot exist without private property. You've got to have private property of trade. You can't buy and test sell things unless you own them. And if you can't buy and sell things, you don't have capitalism. You have to have markets. So capitalism depends on it. The problem then is that the state steps in to maintain private property rights. The state becomes the manager of the private property system. The state, in turn, is also then, according to Marx, part of the capitalist system, part of the capitalist class. The conditions under which definite productive forces can be applied are the conditions of a rule of a definite class of society whose social power deriving from its property has its practical idealistic expression in each case in the form of the state. Property is the economic basis and the state is involved with that. Okay. And we'll come back and see property in the last section on revolution and one of his major calls is to abolish property, private property, as opposed to it. The state is the dictatorship of the capitalist class over society. It enforces property rights and in so doing maintains the capitalist system. As Marx says, the state, quote, the state is nothing but a machine for the oppression of one class by another, end quote. Would he have, would he have said that the state came before property rights or the other around? No, property rights came first because they're economic. He would have agreed that. Yeah. And he would have followed common law and all that and looked at the history and said that the state now is used to maintain this system. The state is. He has to do that to fit with his economic, his model that economics is the basis of everything. Okay. Money in the state. Now, this is a little more in-depth study of the role of the government in dealing with money. I think it's important to spend a few minutes on it because money is such a key part of a capitalist system. In fact, it's, key, it's central to a capitalist system, and Marx is quite aware of how the government now becomes part of the money-creating process and sees this as part of the, as a way in which the government or the state is now attempting to prop up or maintain the capitalist system, capitalist relations. He, he first starts off by noting that the state does not initially create money. Money is initially created in the private sector. And he quotes Perdun and then critiques Perdun on this. Perdun says, money is born of sovereign consecration. The sovereigns take possession of gold and silver and affix their seal to it. Marx doesn't agree with that. It, it, the state doesn't initially create money. Money is created in the capitalist system. Thus the whims, this is Marx, thus the whims of sovereigns is for M. Perdue the highest reason in political economy. Truly one must be destitute of all historical knowledge not to know that it is the sovereigns who in all ages have been subject to economic conditions, but they have never dictated laws to them. Legislation, whether political or civil, never does more than proclaim, express in words, the will of economic relations. And that point. 
the political expresses economic relations. Was it the sovereign who took possession of gold and silver to make them the universal agents of exchange by affixing a seal to them? Or was it not rather these universal agents of exchange which took possession of the sovereign and forced him to affix a seal to them and thus give them a political consecration? So he's saying money gets the state backing when money chooses to get backing by the state. The state does, is a, does what the capitalists want it to do. One of the areas in which he talks about this, and I, we won't go into um, detail on this, he looks a lot at gold as an international money, a world money, a universal money. Gold is money created by capitalism that's transnational, and still is in many ways today. He says, national money discards its local character and the capacity of universal money. One national currency is expressed in another, and thus all of them are finally reduced to the content of gold or silver, the two commodities circulating as world money. And if you view gold as a type of capitalist money, then I think you get a feel what Marx is saying. This is something that's beyond the state. But you know, the most of the state can attempt to do is outlaw the use of gold as money, as it's done um, since the time of Marx in many areas. Marx, Marx is, follows that even in his time period. He w so this money as an economic institution comes out of the market system, out of capitalism, but eventually the state's going to step in and the transition from gold money to paper money. They're moving away from a money that's got labor embodied in it to a money that's fictitious, that's just printed on printing presses. The state becomes necessary for that, and his view is that the capitalists use the state to create this fictitious money. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's no dummy on this. On this stuff, I think he's dead on. I'll, when I finish this section, we'll talk about the creation of the Federal Reserve System in the States, which a Marxist would say is just the capitalist class creating a central bank to prop up capitalism. And he's quite aware of it. And a very, and especially for the time period, 1860s, he's writing this stuff, which is uh, early on. In, in this development of financial systems. Okay. Um, he sees the transition from gold to paper as internal to the capitalist process. He says, in the same way as the exchange value of commodities is crystallized into gold money as a result of exchange, so gold money in circulation is sublimated into its own symbol, first in the shape of worn gold coin, then in the shape of subsidiary coin, and finally in the shape of worthless counters, scraps of paper, and mere tokens of value. So he goes three stages. First you get the coin debasing itself, and then you get sort of pseudo coins, which would be like our coins that we have in the countries today, and then you get just paper, just, just paper. And if you take it a step further today, you just have computer blips. It's not even paper anymore. It's something like 90% of the money supply is just bits of just little electrical impulses on computers at Standard Bank and whatever. It's not even pieces of paper in our billfolds. It's gotten very sophisticated. Uh, so when they talk about turning on the printing presses, they don't even have to do that. You just type a few numbers on a computer and new money is made. Agreements. Hmm? It's just, just agreements. Just agreements, yeah. Uh, so there is no real labor-based money anymore, commodity-based money. Um, the movement from gold to war, worn, worn gold coins occurs in the market over time. The market itself debases the currency. <laughs> but the gold coin continued to function as a coin despite the loss of metal it incurred. It circulated not because it was worn, but because it was worn to a symbol because it continued to circulate. But it was worn to a symbol because it continued to circulate. Only insofar as in the process of circulation, gold currency became as mere token, becomes as mere token of its own value, can mere tokens of value be substituted for it. Our exposition has shown that gold in the shape of coins, that is, tokens of value divorced from the gold substance itself, originates in the process of circulation itself and does not come about by arrangement of st or, or state intervention. Quite explicit that the gold coins start losing their value. And see, if they lose their value, that means if, but lose their gold content but have the same denominated value, that means that more of them are being created, and this is starting to move towards this notion of creating credit, uh, artificial credit. The state steps in in the move from worn gold coins to subsidiary coins. The debasing of money carried on for centuries by kings and princes to such an extent that of the original weights of the coins, nothing in fact remains but the names. Um, and you'll see that terms like the dollar. The dollar used to be a weight. It used to be a specific weight, just like an inch or a kilogram or a kilometer. The dollar was a weight. It isn't anymore. It's just a name. Because um, weight changes about every 10 seconds these days, it seems. 
both the establishing of mint price and the technical working of minting devolve upon the state. The state eventually takes it over. Um, I can give you one example that locally, just to give you an example of how this develops, this isn't in the notes. In Colorado, there was a company called the Clark Gruber Company in the 1860s. And Clark Gruber Company decided to stop Gruber. G-R-U-B-E-R, -E Clark Gruber Company, the two guys, Clark and Gruber. They came out from Kansas City to Denver in the 1860s, and at that time, Denver was about the size of this room, and it wasn't much of a town. But there was gold mining out there, and people were trading in bags of gold dust. And they would have these little one-ounce bags of gold dust, and they'd buy and sell things. Well, the merchants would mark these gold dust bags down 10% because part of it was impurities. Part of it was real dust and not gold. Clark and Gruber came out and said, there's a market to be made if we can turn these into coins. So they took the gold test and started minting coins out of them, um, one ounce gold coins, and they would charge a 5% service charge. So if somebody really had a good ounce of gold, they could then make a 5% profit. Instead of getting a 10% discount, they'd only have a 5%, they'd get a coin out of it. So they started minting these coins, and they're called... They had little pictures of Pikes Peak, which is one of the major mountains in Colorado on them, and they had gold coins, and then they even made currency, paper currency, that was 100% gold-backed, and the company did exceptionally well. Their coins made it all over the world as far as Australia by 1860 to 1863. In three years, the coins were being circulating in Sydney. The paper currency was circulating at about 20 to 1 to the U.S. dollar by 1863 because the U.S. dollar was being depreciated to fight the Civil War at the time. And so, the, but they had 100% gold-backed currency, and they did quite well. But what happened was is that the government, the central government in Colorado, and uh, excuse me, Washington, D.C., minted all the coins in the states. But at that time, Colorado was still a territory, and there was no law against private minting in a territory. You could think about saying if there was a law that you couldn't mint in South Africa, but you could maybe mint in Southwest Africa, that type of thing. So they were able to do it, but the U.S. government didn't like this. And so what they eventually did is they went in and bought out the Clark Gruber Company and bought out their mining process. And Clark Gruber Company was quite happy because this meant the federal government was bringing bucks into the community. This community was, like I said, the size of this room. And so here was the federal government setting up and moving in. They were originally planning to open a mint in New York City. There was a mint in Philadelphia, is the major old mint. Instead of putting it in New York City, which, you know, is a massive city and was in the 1860s, they put it in this boondock place. It was like Kimberly or something out in the middle of nowhere. Um, except a lot poorer than Kimberly was. And they put it, um, put it in there, and eventually now today we have the Denver Mint, which is one of the major mining facilities of the U.S. government. Clark Gruber Company now is the major bank in Colorado. It's the first national bank of Colorado, but they sold the mining process off. This would be a type of thing that Marx would be looking at, is that the state was moving in and taking over mining procedures from the private sector. It was going on right at that time. Um, it's interesting, if you go to the Mint in Denver, you can get a tour. You know, they don't give free samples, but you can get a tour and see all the coins and stuff. But they don't know about that. And I go in and talk to them and say, why don't you have some of these history of the old Clark Gruber Company? I dug it up because somebody did a master's thesis in the 50s, and I found out about this company. And, but the, the Fed, the, the, excuse me, the Mint doesn't like to talk about that history, it, that it actually bought out. With, it sort of gave an offer they couldn't refuse. They bought out the, the uh, private Mint. Okay, the final transition to this, so we go then to coins and mining coins and so on, and the gov government gets involved in that, and then we move on to paper money, and the state takes the predominant role in the supply of paper money. The way Marx would see it is that the capitalist system uses the state to provide much desired paper money. Paper money approves the ability of the capital of capital to exploit labor. The state intervenes in monetary matters at the bidding of the capitalist class. They want to be able to expand credit. To do that, they've got to divorce money from gold, and to do that, they need state backing. So, le and I would say le mining limits the quantity of gold as money. Legislative acts and technical conditions, the printing conditions, do not limit the state in creating paper money. Once you allow for paper money, you can make as much as you want. It's, it's easy. It's like printing rolls of toilet paper. It just comes out. Because the pieces of paper have a legal right of exchange, it is impossible to prevent the state from thrusting any arbitrary chosen number of them into circulation and to imprint them at will with any monetary denomination, such as a pound one, pound five, or pound 20. That should be a little pound sign. They can put any number they want in it. Um, okay. 
The only thing that constrains the paper money is it becomes subject to the market. It can never fully be divorced from gold because once you use paper money, it goes out and it, it, it's sold like a commodity. So its value can go up and down in the market. And Marx spends pages and pages and pages analyzing changes in the exchange value of money as paper versus changes in the exchange value of money as gold and all this stuff, and we don't need to go into that. But he's aware of the fact that paper money is inflationary and there's some problems with it, the creation of paper money. How many reams of paper cut into fragments can circulate as money? In this form, the question is absurd. Worthless tokens becomes tokens of value only when they represent gold within the process of circulation and they can represent it only to the amount of gold which have circulated as coin, an amount which depends on the value of gold if the exchange value of the commodities and the velocity of the metamorphoses are given. If you followed any of the quantity theory of money, he's got a quantity theory of money there that says that the, uh, he's in the quantity theory of money saying that the amount of paper depends on the values out there, how much can actually circulate. Actually, more can circulate and will overheat the economy, and then what happens is the economy crashes and there's a move back to gold, and the paper becomes valueless. Yeah. Could I suggest there's another factor, and that is power. You're powerful enough, you circulate what you want. Well, that's the use of the state. The state is the power. The capitalists are using the state as, an ins as a power institution to circulate paper. And the way they do it is they make a legal tender. It's required by law. You have to deal in that currency. I ask you, does the state need to take an active role in managing money and credit? Does it need to go even further and nationalize money and credit? Marx is funny. He's very against it on one hand. He sees this as part of the capitalist system. But on the other hand, one of his platforms in the Communist Manifesto is for the government to set up a central bank. He says, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. And we'll see that quote later on again when we talk about his platform for revolution. But part of it, a, a good Marxist advocates central banking, is a way to put it. If you're a free enterprise person, you don't like central banking. If you're a Marxist, you like central banking. I don't know if I'd say that to the head of the Reserve Bank, that he's really a Marxist. But Marx advocates central banking as a means to eventually to socialism. What they're actually aiming at is to, uh, is to have it divided in a more just way. No. no, we're good. No, hang on. Wait, Dave. We'll get to the aiming later. Let's hang with the money first. Um, it's a state institution. He, we see what he, it's complicated. He's very confused on politics. I should say I should have said that earlier on. On the one side, he sees this political system as a puppet of, of capitalism, but on the other side, later on, you'll see that he also advocates using the political system as a means to revolution. So, so he gets caught up in that, and then on the other hand, he, then on the third hand, he says destroy the political institution, smash the state. So he's got this, you know, he's sort of, this is part of capitalism. No, this is a, an institutional structure we can use to put in socialism. No, this thing has to be destroyed. You know, it's, he goes back and forth. Depends on, you know. He's against an inflating currency, except that he, in his, in the economics we talked about last week, that's what his, uh, how he sees the instability coming about. So he says this will happen. So he's against it in one sense, but not in the sense that if it brings about instability, he's not against it because he wants that to cause the crisis. But he's against it as something that should happen in the future in a post-capitalist system. He's analyzing it as part of a capitalist system for inflation. There won't be any money, yeah. But then the transition phase becomes tricky, and we'll talk about that next week. What do you do when you're sort of one foot in capitalism and one foot in communism? You just sort of hang in there like Gorbachev is doing. You, know, you figure out what you're trying to do. OK. He also says that this is a stronger position consistent with his theory of history and his revolutionary fever about destroying banking. He says, and destroying money and credit. He says, the uprising of the proletariat is the abolition of bourgeois credit, for it is the abolition of bourgeois production and its order. Public credit and private credit are the economic thermometer by which the activity of a revolution can be measured. The more they fall, the more the fever and generative power of the revolution rises. So there he's, he's getting at this notion that we'll get rid of this system, not necessarily take it over. OK, on to central banking. Now we the state has gone in, and it's created a paper money system, the way it's going to ensure this is through the creation of central banking. And I we emphasize my point from last week, cheap credit policy is Achilles heel of capitalism. 
but is for precisely the development of the credit and banking system which reduces the metal reserve to a minimum in certain phases of the cycle so that it can no longer perform the functions for which it is intended. It is the developed credit and banking system which creates this oversensitiveness of the whole organism. Marx says the central bank is the pivot of the credit system. He looks heavily at the role of the Bank of England. He studies how the Bank of England operates at the time. And the Bank of England is becoming a central bank at the time and getting li licensed to do central bank activities. The Bank of England uses, um, and he talks about the discovery of gold in California, Australia. The gold comes into England. England uses this gold as a base for the issue of new paper money. Says Marx, this gold was deposited in the Bank of England. The depositors received notes for it, which they did not directly redeposit with the bankers. By this means, the circulating medium was unusually increased. The bank strove to utilize these deposits by lowering its discount to 2%. So it was allowing for uh, fractional reserve banking. The bank serves then as a manager of the states of the capitalist inflationary policies. And what we have here is the birth of a centrally managed system of fractional reserve banking in which we allow banks to lend out more money than they bring in at, with the support of the central government, a lot legitimizing, if you will, to legalize cartel. Just as everything in this credit system is doubled and tripled and transformed into a mere phantom of the imagination, so it is with the reserve fund, where only one would, uh, where only one would at least hope to grasp onto something solid. Ultimately, then, the reserve funds actually merge with the reserve fund of the Bank of England. However, this reserve fund also has a double existence. The reserve fund is equal to the supply of notes which the bank is authorized to issue over the notes of circulation. He's talking now, of, and this is complicated in banking, but he's talking about how the whole fractional reserve system is based. You have to keep a certain amount of reserve, and eventually it all goes to the central bank, and the central bank has a certain license for how much you can expand credit. Okay, confidence in credit in, it rests on the backing of the notes of the Bank of England. By the time of Marx's day, your, your currency was good because the Bank of England backed you, or your notes were good in your bank because the Bank of England backed your bank. Um, and as he notes, the bank's notes have credit only thanks to the state. The state backs the bank. Only the, and in times of crisis, and it's the Bank of England's notes that are the most valuable. They're the good ones. And the, the, the circulating notes of all the other banks, bills of exchange, um, lose their value. Only the banknote retains, at least thus far in England, its ability to circulate because the nation with its total wealth backs up the Bank of England. So this is how the, the system's set up. This, the bank plays a central role in managing the expansion and contraction of credit, says Marx. The largest capital power in London is, of course, the Bank of England, which also knows enough about the ways and means of feathering its nest. And so far as the bank issues notes which are not covered by bullion reserve in its vaults, it creates symbols of values that constitute for it not only circulating medium, but also additional, even if fictitious, capital to the nominal amount of these unbacked notes. And this additional capital yield additional profit. The power of the Bank of England is revealed by its regulation of the market rate of interest. Quite a modern statement of how central banking works for <coughs> so somebody writing in the 1860s. Okay, government intervention in the banking occurs because of the desire for cheap credit, and Marx would say a capitalist then therefore create a central <coughs> bank. They want cheap credit, the only way they're going to get it is through state backing, so they create a central bank that's state bank backed to create cheap credit. And the talk give you a case study of this would be a case to look at the history of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. I don't know the history of the Reserve Bank here, but I can give you the U.S. history. The United States did not have a central bank from the time of its from the time of Jamestown in the 1600s through the revolution in the 1770s up until 1913. There were two attempts at national banks that were started, the first national bank and second national bank. Both of them were declared unconstitutional. They were listed, they existed for very short periods of time early in the 19th century. At the early part of the 20th century, there was a, a move started to create a central bank. The move was started by New York City bankers. They, they were the ones that lobbied the federal government to create a central bank. They wanted the central bank in New York City. One of the problems that was going on from the viewpoint of New York City is that banking services were starting to become decentralized. New York City was losing its power in money and banking in the country. Banks in Chicago were building up, in Dallas, in San Francisco, 
and so on. And people were starting to bank locally instead of banking in, in New York. The New Yorkers didn't like this. They didn't like the fact that they were losing their, their, their fingers on this uh, on money and credit in the country. And so they, they went to the government and said, we'd like a reserve bank. Tied with that was there was a lot of instability going on with economic expansion and crash, expansion and crash. That was quite apparent that it had to do with credit creation on the part of the banks. And they, at the time, by the time of 1910 or something like that, there was a major crash in which my, I wish I had this information in the States. It was Chase Manhattan, the former Chase Manhattan, one of these big banks bailed out the rest of the banks. So there was one crash in which one of, the, one of the private banks was able to keep the other banks from going under and prevented a huge economic crisis. Then they made the case that we can't let just the bank do that. This is a problem for the nation. The nation has to back the banking system, not just the banks. So they made a proposal. It was shot down. In 1910 was a crash. Um, everybody said the bankers caused it. These guys made a proposal. The government didn't like it. Uh, politicians didn't like it because you don't. Whatever the bankers said is bad because bankers are evil, and so they finally set up a secret meeting to put a plan together. And bankers went down on a secret train car, sealed train car, to an island off the coast of Georgia. Met with senators. New York bankers went down, met with senators, and set up a new plan to be able to package a central bank that would get through Congress. One of the key parts of the plan was to make a 12-branch central bank. Instead of just having one branch in New York City, they would have 12 regions. And this way, they could get some of the money flowing to other parts of the country and, and political votes to get, to get the votes. So we have a central bank with branches in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Kansas City, Dallas, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Minnesota, St. Louis, and so on, Atlanta. Also, and if you look at American money, it'll tell you which bank it comes from. It's right on there. It may come from Atlanta. It may come from San Francisco. The money is issued by region in the country. 1913. Um, one of the reasons for another, if you get into the conspiracy theory aspect of it, another reason for that is um, they needed to start building a institutional structure to be able to expand credit to the, st to the state, to the government, to prepare itself for the, f for the First World War. Um, and so this thing was put together. It got passed. The New York branch is still the most powerful branch. It's a very complicated power structure in which the president of the New York bank always sits on the board of governors of the bank, and the other ones all rotate. But this, so the New York is the chief one, and the open market operations take place in New York, and all the gold is in the New York bank. And so it's sort of that's the big one of the group. And the, and the bankers were able to put in their, their, if you will, legalized cartel system in which now the government backs credit expansion in the banks. And the Marxists will look at this history and say, see, state is part of a capitalist system. The, the state, the capitalists use the state to do this. This, this history is, was the, written by a Marxist historian, what I gave you named Gabriel Kolkol, K-O-L-K-O, -L -L, and also has been followed up by libertarian historians like Murray Rothbard, who follows the same logic and sees the same thing going on. Rothbard will come to different conclusions and say we need to limit the power of the state, where the Marxists will say we need to limit the power of capitalism. You know, it's the capitalists that are at fault. Okay, so that gives you sort of a case of this notion of uh, the capitalists creating central banking. It's called the Aldrich Plan. If you ever come across it reading that history. And that's an interesting, this is a site, it's an interesting time in U.S. history because uh, from 1776 until 1916, the U.S. was a debtor nation, bought internationally a debtor nation. It borrowed more money than it lent um, around the world. Capital flowed into the country as a developing country. With the advent of the First World War, the U.S. becomes a creditor nation, lends lots of money to its allies to fight for the war, Britain specifically, which Britain now Britain is in debt to one of its former colonies, which it can't stand. France is in debt to the United States, and the U.S. stays a creditor nation from 1915 until about two years ago. And now it's a debtor nation again for the first time since before World War I, which is quite interesting how that's developed. Okay, um, the last section on this is on on bank legislation. And what I'll talk about here is just to give you an example. I just pulled out one act, which is quite interesting, to give you an example how not just the creation of the central bank, but legislation of banks is also sort of tied in with this notion that capitalism uses the state. 
Marx is very interested in analyzing banking reforms and banking laws, and he studies lots of them. One of the ones that he analyzes, analyzes, which is quite interesting, is the Peel's Bank Act of 1844. What this act attempted to do was to limit credit expansion through constraints on the note issuing powers of the Bank of England. And Marx realized that Marx realized that the act prevented continual credit creation in a crisis situation. Although he saw what would happen is when the private sector needed credit, this act would prevent it and cause a crash to hit, to really take off. It would cause interest rates to rise quickly and the economy to speedily crash. He, Marx says, the Bank Act of 1844 thus directly induces the entire commercial world forthwith to hoard a reserve fund of banknotes at the outbreak of a crisis. In other words, to accelerate and intensify the crisis. By such artificial intensification of demand for money accommodation, that is, for the means of payment at the decisive moment, and the simultaneous restriction of the supply of the bank of the supply, the Bank Act drives the rate of interest to a hitherto unknown height during a crisis. Hence, instead of eliminating crises, the act, on the contrary, intensifies them to a point where either the entire industrial world must go to pieces or else the bank act. Okay. So he sees this as a way in which now the central bank is, if you will, keeping an expansion from turning into a cracked up boom on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's a way in which now the bankers are taking over, the bankers start getting power. And the first point, he says, were it not for the Act of 1844, the bank would be able to discount all first class bills presented to it without difficulty. In other words, it, the demand of credit would create, this, would, would create a supply of credit if the bank acted and disallow it. And, but on the other hand, he sees that the high interest rate is precisely the purpose of the act. He notes that the act is set up to hurt the industrial capitalists and help the money capitalists or help the bankers. And in support of that, in the third volume of Capital, he quotes a private banker named Twell, an associate of Spooner, Atwood & Company since 1801, and the Bank Act of 1844, who supports the view that the act was in the banker's interest. This is, a, this is a quote that Marx has. He's going through the testimony, because there's lots of discussions on this act, and Marx analyzes all the testimony. And this is 12 talking. How do you think that the Act of 1844 is operated? If I were to answer you as a banker, I should say that it has operated exceedingly well, for it has afforded a rich harvest to bankers and money capitalists of all kinds. But it has operated very badly to the honest, industrious tradesman who requires steadiness in the rate of discount that he may be enabled to make his arrangements with confidence. It has made money lending a most profitable pursuit. So he's seen how here legislation being used to make the bankers richer the expense of the rest of the system, which fits with his model we talked about last week. Okay. Question on banking, anybody? Good. I don't know if I have any more answers. You know everything I know about Marx on banking now. That's, that's the end of it. Um, no. They'd vary. They'd be very, in, the, in the United States, it would vary by state. You had state licensing. It's, well, it's a long history. The National Bank Act was created in the 1860s in the United States, and that's why these things called First National Bank of Chicago and First National Bank of this and that. That was created to raise revenue for the government to uh, fight the Civil War, and that sets up the National Act. But then there's lots of state banks. We have state banks in the United States and national banks. There's a lot of state banks are not members of the Federal Reserve System, so it's a complicated system. But most of the bucks are controlled by the Fed. They're not part of the Federal Reserve System. They're separately regulated. It gets complicated. Pardon me? Fort Knox is part of the U.S. Treasury Department. That's, that's gold holdings of the U.S. Treasury, which is separate from the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is independent from the Treasury or the Finance Ministry in the country. They're two separate institutions. And so Fort Knox <coughs> is the gold that the U.S. government owns. The U.S. The Federal Reserve Bank is not owned by the U.S. government. It's a private institution. It's owned by the banks. This, well, your reserve bank, I guess you can buy shares. It's private. You can buy shares on the JSE. Um, I heard that's a good way to get the publications. You buy a few shares and you get the nice brochures. Yeah, pardon me? Yeah, they don't do much, do they? But um, in the States, all the shares of the Federal Reserve Bank are owned by member banks. And the Federal Reserve Bank makes a profit and it pays out dividends to its banks. It makes a profit on its investments, and its investments primarily are U.S. government bonds. So the Federal Reserve Bank buys U.S. government bonds. It pays for those with what? Money. Where does it get the money? 
just makes, doesn't even print it, just sends it across an electronic wire. I mean, it's, that's too old fashioned printing. Yeah, it just, it just makes it up. But it does make a return because the government has to pay its, pay its bonds it's borrowing. So the Federal Reserve Bank is heavily invested in the U.S. government debt and makes a profit and pays dividends on that. It's a complicated system. Um, but it's a banker's bank. Yeah. It started off as basically a banker's bank for times of crisis to lend out credit when they needed it. And by the time the Depression comes along, they start getting control over setting interest rates, for example, until even today, well, the, there's a, the Reserve Bank controls the interest rate on current accounts in the States, what we call ch uh, checking accounts. Uh, um, they um, required more and more banks to be members. They controlled uh, um, the, the Oper actual operating procedures of the banks and so on. And that comes up in the 30s. And then there was another big move about five years ago, but now so about seven years ago, 1980, there was a whole new reform in the, in the Federal Reserve Bank has an even more power today. Very, very powerful institution. Well, that's another thing, deposit insurance. It's, too, it's complicated. But the point here is just to make the point that a Marxist will view all this as not intervention on the market by the part of the state, but that the market is using the state to set up its own little tools of exploitation. The central bank is part of the process of exploiting labor. A very different view of, the, of how the central bank emerges, even though they may have similar views as free marketeers as to whether central banks are good. Marx doesn't necessarily see them as good. Uh, he sees them as intensifying crises. Well, they're good in that sense because intensifying crises is good. It brings about revolution. Craig, wouldn't a good point of reference to raise us up be to make an assessment of those people that are outside the banker's power and those that are in it? In other words, um, you know, it's hard to judge that. It's hard to try and see what, whether there's any just basis for it. Yeah. It might be something. It's hard to judge um, who's in bank or power today. But I it's too much about what's going on in the nation. No, it'd be an interesting lecture. Okay, imperialism. I wasn't going to do this one, but I thought I should spend a few minutes on it because of the role of Marxist imperial, Marxist Leninist imperial ideology, imperialistic ideology with respect to countries like South Africa. So I thought well, I should give you a little bit on imperialism. Marx views imperialism as a thing of the past, Marx specifically. The idea of capitalist imperialism is Leninist. It's not Marxist, but you can get it out of Marx. It depends on how you read it. Marx sees that capitalism is moving beyond imperialism, that the old system, the system of mercantilism, which was the trade relations before capitalism, was the system of imperialism, colonization, and so on, and that capitalism would replace that with free trade. Um, under mercantilism, what you have in the mercantilist system, you have ruling nations, England, France, Portugal, Holland, whatever. Under mercantilism, ruling nations adopted policies to assure trade surpluses. They wanted gold flowing into their countries. And this is why even today you have this big hang-up about trade surpluses. Everybody wants trade surpluses. It's an old mercantilist attitude. It goes back a long time ago that we haven't got out of our system yet. This idea that trade surpluses are good and deficits are bad. I personally like deficits. I'll give people pieces of paper any day and take their products. You know, if they want to take my paper and I can get their Hondas and Toyotas and, and whatever goodies, I'll, I'll take the goodies and give them paper. I love depends deficits. How, depends how powerful the army is. Well, that's, this is not an army here today. Today it's a free trade system. And this period army was important. Under mercantilism, what happened is that countries would take over counties they would set up monopoly charters and force those counties to, to export cheap raw materials to the mother country. And then the mother country would export finished goods at a higher price to the colonies. So the colonies are always running trade deficits. The mother country is always running trade surpluses. Then what they would do with that gold is they would buy mercenaries, military, to maintain the colonies because they'd have to keep them oppressed to keep the system going. The only way they could do that was the military force. So the gold flowed back out as you paid your soldiers to go out and, and oppress your colonies all, all over the world. And this was the system of monopoly, state monopoly mercantilism that you had with England and India and the United States and South Africa and you have with Holland and South Africa and also the United States at one time and Indonesia and on you go. 
Okay. Well, when they tried to trade with the blacks, they were breaking them and offering them the Dutch and India company on the case. And they passed the first law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first law was that they could not trade with the blacks. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's all involved with the old mercantilism. Yeah. Apartheid's a mercantilist policy, not a capitalist policy. That would be an interesting argument. That would be an interesting little thing to look at. Um, in the United States, the revolution was started on the basis of mercantilism. The Boston Tea Party, which is a famous um, terrorist attack on merchant, on merchant ships. And what happened there is that Americans for years have been buying tea from the Dutch, tea from Java, from Batavia, at good prices, and the British, and after 1763, the British finally settled their war with France. They decided time to start dumping on the American colonies again, and they started putting up some new laws. Well, one of them was you buy tea from the British East India Trading Company, not the Dutch East India Trading Company, i.e., buy tea from, from India, not from Java, not from Indonesia, and the Americans didn't want it. They didn't like the tea, and it was also more expensive, and so they dumped all the, all the British tea into the harbor, and that started to towards the revolution. It was a act, strong act of terrorism at the time, all tied in with mercantilist monopoly power. Okay. Um, so what happens then in, in Marx's term is capitalism re replaces empire with trade. Now you have free trade, and he sees this as necessary, but he doesn't call that empire. He doesn't call that imperialism. He just says that that's world trade. Um, the need of a constantly expanding world market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. That's the idea that capitalism is going to grow all over the place. As I said, the modern theory of capitalism starts with, um, with Le uh, Lenin. Actually, it starts with a Britisher named Hobson who writes a book on this in the 1880s, and then Lenin picks up on it and makes it popular. And what they do is they sort of internationalize Marxist theory of overproduction. They argue that if you can't sell the products domestically, you've got to sell them overseas. So what they do is they sort of mix this whole, no whole notion of, um, of mercantilism with free enterprise and come up with something called capitalist imperialism, that it's forcing sale of products overseas. <coughs> and so uh, Africa is exploited in a f by multinational corporations. So you get that stuff ad nauseum in the states where people are always worried about the exploitation of African nations and South American nations by IBM and Exxon and all this. Okay. And the argument there is that the capitalist nations are attempting to export to prevent economic crisis and so doing capitalism spreads. He, um, you get a feel for this in Marx. Marx says, capital invested in the colonies may yield a higher rate of profit for the simple reason that the rate of profit is higher where capitalist development is still in a backward stage. And for the added reason that slaves, coolies, etc., permit a better exploitation of labor. I can see no reason why these higher rates of profits, when sent home, should not enter there as elements in the average rate of profit and in proportion contribute to keeping them up. So he sort of sees, yeah, it's good to do this trade in the und underdeveloped world. At that time, we used to call it the primitive world because you can make higher profits, you can exploit workers. I remember hearing a lecture by Marxists talking about capitalists exploiting women in, in the People's Republic of China now with these slave women factories on the coast and all this stuff. So you still get that feel of the thing of capitalism exploiting cheap labor overseas. Okay. One year, so Lenin, Lenin sees that this is going to, capitalism is an imperialistic thing. It takes over the world, and in Lenin's view, then when the revolution comes, it's going to be a worldwide revolution. We're going to throw the bums out worldwide. And we're going to have this enormous revolution, which, as we know, didn't happen. To get a sort of feel of this, this capitalism expanding, I've got a rather long quote on Marx's analysis of British imperialism in India. Um, I couldn't find anything on South Africa. I don't think there was much in the 1860s to really look at, but India was well along. And you, this, I'll go through this because I think it's interesting to realize that this guy is also studying economic development in third world countries, too in this idea of capitalism there. Write Did he write to the Cape Times once? Eh? Yeah. I wonder what he wrote. It'd be interesting to read that old letter. Um, England has to fulfill a double mission in India. Interesting, double mission. One destructive, the other regenerating. First, the annihilation of the old Asiatic society and the laying of the material foundations of Western society in Asia. So the destructive one is to destroy the old society, which Marx says is fine. Get rid of the culture. 
that's an old, rotten, lousy culture and put in a Western society. That's the regenerative one, is to, you know, civilize these people out there. Modern industry resulting from the railway system will dissolve the hereditary divisions of labor upon wh which rest the Indian castes, those decisive impediments to Indian progress and Indian power. He certainly didn't respect cultures. You know, Western imperialism was fine with him. The Indians shall not reap the fruits of the new elements of society scattered among them by the British bourgeoisie, till in Great Britain itself the new ruling class shall have been supplanted by the industrial proletariat, or till the Hindus themselves shall have grown strong enough to throw off the English yoke altogether. I question the comment that they haven't gotten rich since they got rid of the British either. The profound hypocrisy and inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization lies unveiled before our eyes, turning from its home where it assumes respectable forms to the colonies where it goes naked. You can imagine Marxist, third world Marxists reading things like this. They just love it. It's good stuff. The devastating effects of English industry when contemplated with regard to India are palpable and confounding. They are only the organic results of the whole system of production as it is now constituted. That production rests in the supreme rule of capital. The centralization of capital is essential to the existence of capital as an independent power. The destructive influence of that centralization upon the markets of the world does but reveal in the most gigantic dimensions the inherent organic laws of political economy now work in every civilized town. The bourgeois period of history has to create the material basis of the new world. When a great social revolution shall have mastered the results of the bourgeois epic, the market of the world and the modern powers of production and subjected them to the common control of the most advanced peoples, most advanced peoples, i.e. Westerners, then only will human progress cease to resemble that hideous pagan idol who would not drink the nectar but from the skulls of the slain. It gets heavy once in a while. Um, okay, so this he, this notion that the state is somehow working with capitalists to set up this capitalist imperialist system you can see it in Marx, and as I say, it, it gets picked up later in Leninism, and when you talk about Marxist-Leninism, the imperialism is really Leninist, not Marxist. Okay, question on that. You guys with me? You could almost be describing a communist state there. Almost, yeah. We'll get to that description. Those are fun. Let's do, let's do um, labor movements, and then we'll take a break. There's just two sections to this. It's a shorter section. Um, it's, I talk about the emergence of the proletariat class and then the emergence of trade unions in, uh, in that. And then from there, we'll take a break and come back and talk about revolution. Hey, the, again, the first section tonight was to emphasize that the, in capitalism, the state is part of the capitalist system. And so you're going to have to get rid of both of them, probably. They have, have communism. Okay, first on the proletariat class. With the development of capitalism comes the development of the proletariat class. Capitalism creates the proletariat. Um, and again, the proletariat is a class of people whose only source of income is their labor. They do not own capital. And this is, to me, a major flaw in Marxism, but he believes that there's going to be a class of people that are only selling their labor and a class of people that live off of capital. He doesn't see people being both. He has two major groups, labor sellers, wage earners, wage labor, and capitalists. Um, an early explanation of this relationship, you can see it's sort of dialectic. This comes on, in, I think it was in the economic and philosophic manuscripts. Surely he says this is an ultimate development. Mm -hmm. This isn't a description of, of the real world he encounters. No, he sees it. But if you think back then, how many people own shares? Probably very few. You know, and he no, but he says surely throughout his work that ultimately there are many classes, many gradations. But they're sort of moving. Continuum, uh, but it's sort of like an hourglass effect. That ultimately, it splits off and ultimately, the, as he calls it, the two great classes. The two great classes, right. He does see that. And, he, and as I said, he talked about how the industrialists have been forced into the proletariat class. So if ultimately he sees a very small capitalist class and a massive proletarian class. But he doesn't, he doesn't have this idea of pension fund socialism, if you will, this notion that the workers may own shares. It's but he also doesn't, have, doesn't anticipate the trading class, see, the entrepreneurs who are not owners of capital, yeah. but suppliers of services, yeah. well, which he, is now the biggest sector of the economy. Yeah, he would, he, if he, 
Marx would see those as um, part of the proletariat, I think, because they don't own capital, but he doesn't, because those are like the industrialists, they're sort of like entrepreneurs. They borrow the money and they do creative things with it. Agents. But they'd be at agents. At the time of Marx, trade is a small sector of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, trade is now in the advanced economy is 60% of mm -hmm. economic activity. So it's just a development which we... He didn't, didn't pick up on. That makes sense. It doesn't fit them in anyway in analysis. No, he has a hard time with, well, the, with entrepreneurs, he has definitely a hard time with the whole notion of trade, he has a hard time. The whole notion of marketing, he has a hard time, and this is a problem that the Soviet countries have today. There's very little respect for marketing and trade and kind of the middlemen and the need for middlemen services, and they, it's a problem that they have in structuring their economies. Okay, let's see how the proletariat runs. Proletariat and wealth are opposites. As such, they form a single whole. They are both forms of private property. Private property is private property as wealth is compelled to maintain itself and thereby its opposite, the proletariat, in existence. In order their property at their proletariat, this is going back to that Hegelian dialectic stuff. The property class and the class of the proletariat present the same human self-alienation, but the former class finds in the self-alienation its confirmation and its good, its own power. The class of the proletariat feels annihilated in its self-alienation. It sees in its own powerlessness and the reality of an inhuman existence. Okay. The factory is what creates the proletariat, the factory mode of production, or if you want to take the South African context, the mines create the proletariat and where you've got this in industry that becomes like a military. And Marx uses those analogies of a military all the time. He says, Modern industry has converted the little workshop of the patriarchal master into the great factory of the industrialist, industrial capitalist. Masses of laborers crowded into the factory are organized like soldiers. Not only are they slaves of the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overlooker, and above all, by the individual bourgeois manufacturer himself. So it's the proletariat is born out of factory production. The factory production creates, factory mode of production creates alienation and association. The workers are alienated, as we talked about earlier, but they also are associated, and it's the association of factory that's the economic foundation of the proletariat. Again, it's the economics that builds higher, higher organizations. The proletariat emerges from economic relations. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by the revolutionary combination due to association. The development of modern industry, therefore, cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces and appropriates products. What the bourgeoisie, therefore, produces above all is its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. So in exploiting workers in the mines to, to bring gold out, you create the conditions for the revolution by bringing the miners together. And that, that would be a Marxist view. And the Marx would then go on, and we'll see here, and advocate trade unionism as the, as the method to do that, um, which he calls organized associations of labor. Um, they, they emerged from the conditions of bourgeois production, trade unions. But with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses. Its strength grows and it feels that strength more. Um, this is an interruption, thinking of things that he doesn't predict, like trading. He also doesn't predict a decentralization of industry, like what the microcomputers done, what people work in their homes. He's got this view of capitalism as only factory production, masses of people. And we see today that that's changing a lot. The collisions between individual workmen and individual bourgeois takes more and more the character of collisions between two classes. Thereupon, the workers begin to form combinations, trade unions. And those are his words there in print. That's how he wrote it. Trade unions against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the wage rates. They found permanent associations in order to make provision beforehand for these occasional revolts. Trade unions are key to revolutionizing the proletariat. They socialize the workers, and in turn, they form the basis for socialism. In an 1869 speech to a German trade union, Marx says, trade unions are the schools of socialism. It is in trade unions that workers educate themselves and become socialists, because under their very eyes and every day, the struggle with capital is taking place. 
Unions lay hold on the masses in a more enduring way. They alone are capable of representing a true working class party and opposing a bulwark to the power of capital. Trade unions become a political movement in Marxist terms. So you go from the economic system via trade unions to a political movement. Uh, the analysis of what's going on here with, with Nam and Kosatu is you know, quite, quite similar to how Marx would predict the development of a trade union movement. Um, other ones, the Labor Party in Britain, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, other types of sort of trade union labor movements. Marx favors merging regional and issue-based sects, and he uses the word sex into a unified class movement. He doesn't advocate sort of a trade union for mines and another trade union for automobiles. He advocates moving these together into a, a national and international mass movement. The first phase of the struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie is characterized by the movement of sex. This has some justice at a time when the proletariat is not yet sufficiently developed to act as a class. Isolated thinkers undertake the critique of the social contradictions. It is in the nature of sex which form around such pioneers that they alienate themselves from the trade unions and the word from every mass movement. And he, what he does here is he's analyzing all these little tiny movements developing in his time period. Um, he analyzes lots of them. The dissolution of the General Association of German Workers gave the opportunity to take a great step forward and to declare to prove, if necessary, that a new stage of development had now been reached and that the movement was right for the sectarian movement to merge in the class movement and make an end to all sectarianism. The, in other words, the unification of, of private <coughs> uh, worker movements. He's opposed to, and I just put some of the names up to show you, but instead of saying Marxists, we might have been talking about Sansimonists or Fourierists or Icarians or Owenites or Lasellians. These were other big movements at the time besides Marx that he, he proceed step by step to critique every one of these and call for them to make a unified front. He doesn't like competition in the hearts and minds of workers. He wants everybody to get into the rank and file and move lock, step, and bill. How does he do that? By the International. The International was founded in order to replace the socialist to semi-socialist sects by real organization of the working class for struggle. And in 1864, Marx helped set up the Working Men's International Association, which is today called the First International, which is the first major worldwide labor union movement. In 1873, it falls apart, but you know, it worked for a few years. Marx gave the inaugural address at the opening meeting, and this is from the address. To conquer political power has therefore become the great duty of the working classes. They seem to have comprehended this, for in England, Germany, Italy, and France, there have taken place simultaneous revivals and simultaneous efforts are being made at the political reorganization of the Working Men's Party. One element of success they possess, numbers, but numbers weigh only in the balance if united by combination and led by knowledge. Past experience has shown how disregard of that bond of brotherhood which ought to exist between workmen of different countries and incite them to stand firmly by each other in all the struggles for emancipation will be chastised by the common discomfiture of their in incoherent efforts. Th in other words, everybody's got to band together. This thought prompted the working men of different companies assembled on 28 September 1864 in public meeting at St. At Martin's Hall to found the International Association. Proletarians of all countries unite. And you'll see that today when I read in the paper when there was a strike at the Mercedes plant here in South Africa that the workers in Germany were striking in solidarity. You know, that that move is, that element of an international labor solidarity is still there and it's something that Marx not only talked about theoretically, but this is an area in which he was politically active. He was actively involved in promoting an international trade union movement to smash capitalism. Okay, question. How big was the first international? Very small. I think it was more puffed than anything else, but it's blown up historically. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I gather in the first meeting, he didn't say anything when they formed it, and then he just sort of sat there, and these guys talked, and then he went back and wrote the address, and he was a good writer, so he did the address and sort of stuffed in after it got formed. But um, I don't know the exact size. From what I gather, it wasn't that big. Yeah. But in, if you read the history of these, they, they, it's given great emphasis in the history of labor union movements. You know, it's a great move. Okay, so you see the trade unions then as part of the process towards revolution. Trade unions actually coming out of the capitalist system, the nature of factory production and so on. 
Tea time. That's it. Let's take a break. So spicy, thanks. Okay. Before we um, push on the revolution, I just was talking for a second with Frances Kendall, and she made the point that um, Marx's view of state capitalism has a ring of truth to her, and in a sense, Marx's view, the state is part of capitalism. It made me think of a statement that Milton Friedman had said years ago that the biggest enemies of capitalism are the capitalists and the intellectuals. Those are your two major groups that are opposed to capitalism. The capitalists want monopoly power any way they can get it, and the intellectuals want to control things, and so they don't like capitalism because it's freed, it's too decentralized. Um, and so in that, on the side of the capitalists, you'll see that there is a tendency for capitalists to try and use the state to gain privileges. And in that sense, there's some truth to what Marx is saying. From my viewpoint, though, the, the solution is to limit the ability of the capitalists to use the state, to limit the ability of them to take it over. One of the ways to do that is to limit the state itself and its role in, in an economic system. But do you do see that. You do see capitalists going, and we're in the states. It's gotten to the point now that it just makes you sick of how all these capitalists go to Washington, D.C., looking for special privileges and special grants and so on. So there is a ring of truth there. But Marx is going to say the way to deal with state capitalism is not to limit the role of the state, but to abolish capitalism. That's how he's got a different view of how to deal with this problem of state capitalism. Is that what you mean to abolish private property? Abolish what? Private property. Private, private property, yeah, we'll see that. Abolish In private words, property. It's an immature view. No, I don't know if it's immature. It's different. That's it. Well, that's why I won't use that word with him. I think it's a very sophisticated view. It's just very different. Uh, very sophisticated, but I look. It's inane. It, it, it's part of people to own what they are part of. Okay. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't accept that, though. And a lot of people don't. That's his view. He has a different no, view of the world. In a wider basis. He's got now in revolution. We're going to talk about. Uh, what do I have? Three or four topics. Crisis to revolt. Well, I'm going to make the case that it's the economic crisis leads towards the revolution. And then I'm going to talk about violence. And I, my interest seriously is on violence is to explain Marx's in fascination with violence. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about strategy, some of his proposals for reform and change that he puts out. They aren't all that consistent, but I'll give you a little bit. And then finally, destruction, which builds on violence in Marx's call for the way social progress via destruction. And these, to me now, his model of revolution and view of this is one of the scary things of Marxism. It's, it's, a, it's a very um, um, strong cry, cry to destroy, not to build up. OK, let's start. Let's tie the economics to revolution first. Crisis to revoke. Capitalism is crisis prone, as we've, we've pointed out. Marx speaks of the kind contradictions within which bourgeois production is carried on, in which even at a cursory glance, we view it as only transitional historical form. Again, by reemphasis, capitalism produces alienation, exploitation, contradictions, crisis, and ultimately its own demise. Capitalism destroys itself. Quote, beyond a certain point, the development of productive forces becomes a barrier for capital. Thus, capitalist relationships become a barrier for the development of the productive forces of labor. Labor can't develop under capital. The growing incompatibility of the productive development of society with its established relationships <coughs> with production is expressed in acute contractions, crises, and convulsions. The violent annihilation of capital not through external relationships, but as a condition of its own self-preservation is the most striking form in which notice is given to it to be gone and give room to a higher stage of social production. He's saying that the crisis and the destruction of capital values and economic crisis is the sign that says it's time to move on, time to move on to a better economic system than capitalism. Again, money and credit are the instruments of the crisis. As long as the social character of labor appears as the money existence of commodities, and thus as a thing external to actual production, money crisis independent of or as an intensification of actual crises are inevitable. Marx doesn't favor monetary reform, though. He, that's not his road. He says it is clear that there is a shortage of a means of, of, means of payment during a period of crisis. 
Ignorant and mistaken legislation such as that of 1844 and 45 can intensify this money crisis, but no kind of bank legislation can eliminate a crisis. The state cannot prevent economic crises. Okay? The only way to deal with the depreciation of money, with inflation, with economic crisis, is to abolish money, not to reform it. The only solution to capitalist crisis is to abolish capitalism. I say abolish money, abolish markets. In the Grunerissa, Marx presented a clear program, quote, to prevent the periodic depreciation of money. And he said, in the Grunerissa, in the last formulation of the problem, in the last formulation, the problem would have reduced itself to how to overcome the rise and fall of prices, and how by doing away with the exchange value. But this problem arises. Exchange corresponds to the bourgeois organization of society. Hence, one last problem, to revolutionize bourgeois, bourgeois society economically. It would then have been self-evident from the outset that the evil of bourgeois society is not to be remedied by transforming the banks or by founding a rational money system. The system cannot be reformed. Okay. And he criticizes people that have faith in capitalism and says that will not solve. You can't just believe capitalism is good. It's not going to solve the problems. All thought of a common, all-embracing, far-sighted control of the production of raw materials gives way once more to the faith that demand and supply will mutually regulate one another. And it must be admitted that such a control is, on the whole, irreconcilable with the laws of capitalist production and remains forever a pious wish. In other words, supply and demand do not spontaneously equilibrate in a market. Markets are inherently chaotic. To him, the crisis set the stage for the communist revolution. In his Yes. Uh, does he not say in that paragraph that it's not feasible to try to control production rather than the supply and demand not work? And it must be admitted that such a control is on the whole irreconcilable with the laws of capitalist production. No, the, the, the control of... Um, the pious wish to try to control production. Well, yeah, he's, he's saying that all thought of a common, all-embracing and far-sighted control of production of raw materials gives way once more to the faith. He's saying that the market is going to try and do demand and supply. Marx is going to advocate, quote, a common, all-embracing, far-sighted control of production, which he's going to say that it's community decision-making and production. And this little extract is saying that those people think that supply and demand are going to do it. It isn't going to work. Okay. In the 1850 um, article on the class struggles in France, he writes, such a revolution is possible in the periods when both these factors, the modern productive forces and the bourgeois productive forms, come into collision with each other. A new revolution is possible only in the consequence of a new crisis. The revolution comes from the crisis. Recurring crises create the propertyless proletariat, what Leon was referring to in the fir first part, that the, you get the sh growing, growing propertyless proletariat <coughs> class who then in turn will unionize, if you will, and, and, and usher in communism. This was first pointed out in 1844, Marx and Engels write, in the development of productive forces, there comes a stage when productive forces and means of intercourse are brought into being, which under the existing relationships only cause mischief and are no longer productive but destructive forces, machinery and money. And connected with this, a class is called forth, which has to bear all the burdens of society without enjoying its advantages. A class which forms the majority of all members of society and from which emanates the consciousness of the necessity of a fundamental revolution, the communist consciousness. So this is all building out of the economics. Finally, he sees that the... As a, I, I point out he never alters his positions on the necessity and in the inevitability of a class revolution. He changes the ideas of when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. Most of his life, he thinks it's going to happen in Germany or Britain or America. The very end, he proceeds of his life, he proceeds a revolution in Russia. In the preference to the 1882 Russian edition, which is one year before he died, the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto, he writes, and now Russia. Russia forms the vanguard of revolutionary action in Europe. So he was just right there at the beginning of the Russian revolutionary movement, which, as you know, is where communism first gets um, hold permanent a permanent foothold. Okay. Pardon me. In this, where I took this quote from. Now, he's just noticing it's oh, what he does too. I didn't. 
I don't have that in. I didn't want to put it in because it's a whole other thing. He does talk about the agrarian farmers in Ru the agrarian situation in Russia and that it's basically agrarian and not industrial and that it's mostly private owned land. And he says that maybe these peasant private owned lands may form the faces basis of a new communist system. And so people that follow Ma Mao's agrarian Marxism pick up on those little statements on what he says on Russia. He's looking at that and that fighting the czar. But I think basically he just wanted to sell books yeah. in the communists in Russia, and so he had to say something good about Russia, you know. Yeah? When, when Marx said abolish money, did he have anything in the place for it or, or not? Just says abolish it. The people will decide. By me? He doesn't believe in exchange. Surely he has in mind a system of planning. A system of planning is what. Whereby goods and services are allocated by planners. It's not as clear in Marx as one would like, the whole idea of central planning. But if you read what Marx says to get rid of, the only thing you're left with is central planning. And my, my argument next week will be that this is where socialism moves to, and this is a problem. Central planning doesn't work. But that Marx himself will find some comments on that, but he doesn't develop a clear outline for central planning. But some people have made the case backing into it somewhat like we are. Once you throw everything else, how do you do it? You don't have body, you don't exchange, you must have central planning of some sort. Well, what, what Marx by implication seems to envisage is just that people become uh, conscientized, become That's good. They just start working for society. You, you, you just get up in the morning and go to the tractor factory and make tractors, and the tractors then, without getting any money for them, go out to farming commune where someone gets on the tractor and plows and uh, then the, the millies go off to the, to the housewives who cook them and uh, things just move around because people want them to. Mm -hmm. sort of if you need a pair of shoes you go and take them off the shelf from somewhere. Yeah, Murray Rothbard. Why, Rothbard. as Frank says, it's a kind of a, 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 kind of a dream, a kind of a mythical, it's a religion. Exactly. He, but he believes that consciousness is going to change. Yes, people's you have to be conscientized. You have to stop thinking the way you do. You see, and you, you will stop. work in the morning at the moment. You assume somebody's going to pay you when you sell something. Now that whole assumption has to change. You have to stop being like that. And to stop, you've got to abolish those institutions. When you work when. in a shop, someone walks in and says, I need bread. And you say, well, that's fine. He has bread. And they walk out. You don't, you don't say, you don't ask for money or anything. Frank, could I suggest that he was looking a little back to when you had farming communities that were um, maybe poor, but not very uh, oppressed, and that they were getting along uh, in, in a fairly good way. But he, abol he advocates abolishing those communities to bring in capitalism. We just saw that with India. Wipe out the old traditional modes and the oh, old yes, traditional. He wasn't that no, no, I, no, I no, no. He was very much in favor of getting it. He wants industrialization. Communism will be an industrialized society mm -hmm. in which there will be massive production going on. It's yeah. a society of jets and airplanes and TVs and whatever. It's not a society of farmers sitting out there just enjoying Mother Nature. It's a materialistic society, and it's a system that builds on industry. He wants maybe some of those goody-goody feelings that people sort of romanticize about, but in the context of an industrial society. So he's, he doesn't, doesn't advocate the rural communities at all. He will see later that what he will advocate is industrializing the rural community. That comes in soon. Um, and, and it's just, well, now, well, to see another thing, he never advocates collectivized farming, but if you look at one of these points in the manifesto, it seems like it's pushing towards collectivized farming which is what Stalin finally into. So you get these things, and what you get out of Marx is he doesn't really fully outline where he wants to go, but he outlines where he doesn't want to go, so you can sort of extrapolate that this is the only place to go. But it's hard because it's not fully consistent because he also wants to get rid of the state. So how do you have central planning without a state? In other words, he's busy planning, but he hasn't reached the finality. No, he has. Annihilation of capital, what does he want to destroy? The relations, not the equipment. 
but it gets interpreted by some people to be meaning of destroying the equipment. Now, the equipment will be taken over. He wants to destroy capital relations, embodied labor that's now been taken out into things like money and credit and all this stuff. Doesn't it also mean destroying the people? Isn't that why? Well, it also means destroying the capitalists, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The but people. Yeah, Lenin started, started it. Yeah, Lenin started it. Lenin was the first one to start destroying the, the physical people too. He does say, uh, does advocate that, but not the machinery. That the pe workers will take over. You get into some problems with that because when they start saying destroying the capital, the workers don't know what that means and they start beating up on the machines. And he does, you know, just so things get a little confusing. So you get these all the time, like. Um, what is it, uh, the Marxian line in religion, which we haven't talked about, but everybody knows he's an atheist and is totally opposed to religion, too, that religion is the opium of the people. I read an article a while back that that line was misinterpreted in Soviet Russia, where opium is considered a medicine like um, <laughs> aspirin. So they read it as religion is the medicine of the people. Therefore, Marx is very much in favor of religion. And so they had to change the wording. And um, so things sometimes get misinterpreted. Okay, on violence. The point I want to make here is that Marx has this violent view of the world. So I've just taken some extracts to give you this feel that everything's violent. Um, he does occasionally speak of the possibility to bring about peaceful revolution, a possibility of peaceful revolution to bring about socialism. I have the word capitalism there in the second line on the violence. I mean socialism. Possibility. He does talk about revolutions going on capitalism, but we don't need to go into that. He just as we're doing the revolutions going from capitalism to socialism, Marx records the whole history going to capitalism, but you know, how much can you do in five talks? We don't need to do that. Um, in his speech in Amsterdam in 1872, he says, we are aware of the importance that must be accorded to the institutions, customs, and traditions of different countries, and we do not deny that there are countries like America, England, and if I knew your institutions better, I would add Holland, where workers can achieve their aims by peaceful means. But immediately, the very next sentence, he reintroduces violence. And he says, however true that may be, we ought also to recognize that in most of the countries of the continent, and I want to emphasize that means Germany and France, which are your major economies there, it is force that must be the lever of our revolutions. It is to force that it will be necessary to appeal to for a time to establish the reign of labor. So revolution is going to come by force. It's not going to come by negotiation. And I say violence is predominant throughout his writings, this struggle, conflict, antagonism, and so on. Marx does not see society evolving through peaceful cooperation. It evolves through conflict. And what I did is I just took some phrases out of the Communist Manifesto, this one document to give you a feel of this. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. All the powers of, all, of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exercise this specter. The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. Oppressor and oppressed carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight. Society as a whole is splitting up into two great hostile camps. The leaders of whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeois, he uses military expressions a lot in his writings. The bourgeoisie has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties. It has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal, brutal exploitation. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitations distinguish the bourgeois epoch. The bourgeoisie compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. That's part of his imperialism. And now, and how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces, on the other by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. But not only has the bourgeoisie forged the weapons that brings death to itself, it has also called into existence the men who are to wield those weapons, the modern working class, the proletarians. The bourgeoisie finds itself in a constant battle. Finally, in time when the class struggle nears the decisive hour, the process of dissolution going on within the whole range of old society assumes such a violent, glaring character. We trace the more or less veiled civil war ranging within existing society up to the point where the war breaks out into open revolution and where the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. He doesn't view it as a sort of a cooperative world at all. You know, it's a very much of a struggle. 
and capitalism is a struggle, and capitalism is violence, and therefore the struggle against capitalism should be violent too, legitimately so. Um, okay. Whew, I told you this stuff gets a little depressing. <laughs> it does to me. Um, the section on strategy, I'm just going to give you, he writes a lot of different things, so I'll give you two areas of how they propose strategic steps towards communism, and then next week we'll look a little more into the transition period. But I thought here, an idea that he not, at one time he'll talk about destroying money, and at another time he'll talk about central banking. So there's two things going on in their writings. He says, the immediate name of communists is formation of the proletariat into a class overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, conquest of political power by the proletariat. So now we have this political use of the political system key is to abolish private property. The distinguishing feature of communism is the abolition of bourgeois property. In this sense, the theory of the communist may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. Key planks for reform, these come out of the, uh, out of the communist manifesto, and I'll just read through these and comment on them because they're quite interesting. This was their sort of interim proposals in 1848. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state. And then they go on and give ten proposals. Abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. So the land is nationalized. A heavy progressive or graduated income tax. It's quite, quite modern at that time. There was, there was no income tax in the United States in the 1860s. That doesn't come in until 19... 10 or 11 or something like that is when the U.S. has its first income tax. Well, it was brought in by the war, it? No, it was brought in as a way to tax corporations, was the idea, because of the attack on corporations. It has to do with the progressive era. Yeah, but they needed the money for armaments and stuff like that. There's, some people say that, but I don't think when that came in, it wasn't war yet. It was a flat rate initially. Pardon me? It was a flat rate on corporations, not on income, personal income. There was, a, But the amendment was necessary. Um, to the an amendment was necessary to the Constitution to create an income tax. The U.S. didn't have one until the early part of this century. Was it when? To, equalize, to equalize society? It was to, uh, there was a big fear of the big corporations. In the progressive era, they, there was a period in which the U.S. government finally starts moving into controlling corporations. We have our anti-monopoly anti laws, the progressive income tax. It's a whole big period, 1890 to 1914. It's quite interesting. Much, and we think of the 30s as the period in which the government moves in on the FDR in the states, but this period was very key to development of, of government control of corporations. In 1914 is when they built the tax system. Yeah, I think it was before that. In South Africa. In here, uh, in South Africa. Okay, um, uh, abolition of all rights of inheritance, which is sort of interesting. It that fits in with this abolition of the family, which we'll see later too. Confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. That one is odd to me. He doesn't like immigrants but and rebels, whoever they are, but that's one of them. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. We saw that one. So um, a good Marxist supports central banking, if you take this view. Six, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. One can think of SATs in the post office here as part of the system. It's interesting how many of these exist. Extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. You can think of ESCOM, companies that are owned by the state. Equal liability of all to labor. How about that? I like that one. Forced conscription of labor. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Get the masses out there farming. Everybody is required to work, mandatory work. Combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by more equitable distribution of the population over the country. That is fascinating because that just ties right in with what Pol Pot did. We're doing the centralization here. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to say it. You guys can write the article. Um, that's a, yeah, Pol Pot is if I talked about the first lecture and it's. It fits right in with what they did when they emptied the cities. It fits in terms of Marxist theory. Yeah, as far as I read it. Yeah, it's, well, Pol Pot was definitely Marxist all the way. Um, so this, but what's another place they're doing it, these, you said decentralization, I didn't even thought about that, but in Indonesia, which is a fiercely anti-communist country in which they even outlaw the Chinese language because they hate communism so much, is has a massive 
program of moving the Javanese off of Java, there's about 100 million Javanese on Java, it's a packed little island, and moving them to Sumatra, Kalimantan, uh, to um, Lombok, to um, whatever, Irian Jaya, to all the different islands of Indonesia. And the, the U.S. government's behind it, the World Bank's behind it, the IMF is behind it, the UN is behind it, and basically what these other people view it is Javanese imperialism. They're moving millions of Javanese into these other communities, and the Javanese are taking them over, and it's just, it's right out of, a, out of this manifesto. Yeah. What is, I don't understand what combination of agriculture and Oh, combination of agriculture and manufacturing industries. I could read that a little bit to say that he's going to try and industrialize agriculture that he's going to bring it into the, the capitalist system. And when, when um, Stalin comes to power, what he does is he sets up collective farming. That's one of the Stalin's great contributions. And the collectivized farm was to make the farm into a corporation. People work 8 to 5 and so on. This happened. The crops don't always grow on an 8 to 5 schedule. But he tried to set up farms as corporate on the basis of the U.S. corporate model. Total disaster. It didn't work, as we know. Collective farming is a mess. And I read a little bit of that in there. He's tying agriculture and manufacturing together. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But what happens is collectivized farming. Until now, just recently, they've decentralized farming. Isn't this really uh, a reference to the state?